Thank you very much for joining us, everybody, for, uh, for joining us at the Easy Build tutorial at ISC. Um, I'm Kenneth Hoste. I work at the HPC, Ghent, uh, the HPC team at Ghent University in Belgium. Um, and Alan and Bart will uh, help out with the tutorial today as well. Um, so I'll let both introduce themselves. Alan first. So uh, my name is Alan Lakash. I work at Ulick Supercomputing Center, and I've been contributing to EasyBuild for quite a few years now. Okay, and Bart. Hello, my name is Bart Olman, and um, I work at uh, McGill University in Canada, and as part of the Compute Canada collaboration, so a bit like Praise in the EU and Exceed in the US. Uh, we're also been using Easy Build for quite a few years since at least 2015, and uh, I will present uh, later how we're using Easy Build. So both Alan and, and Bart will be helping out mostly through the the Slack channel. So if you have any questions, feel free to post them there, uh, or if you prefer not to create a Slack account, you can post them in the Zoom chat as well as a backup. Any questions throughout the tutorial are, are welcome there, and I'll try to pause every now and then. Um, to take questions um, in the Zoom session as well, if time allows. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, this is our agenda for today. So I'll give a brief overview of the practical information regarding the prepared environment. Then we'll do an, an introduction to EasyBuild, explain how to install and configure EasyBuild and uh, how to the basic usage about using the tool. Then we'll go ahead and actually install some scientific software with EasyBuild and look at a broken installation and how to fix it. Um, and then after the, the coffee break, um, we'll look at uh, module naming schemes and more specifically hierarchical module naming schemes. How are they supported in EasyBuild and, and how they work? How we can add additional support uh, for software, new versions or uh, new software that is not supported in EasyBuild yet. Um, Alan and Bart will then explain how EasyBuild is used on large HPC sites, both in Ulig and at the Compute Canada um, consortium. And we'll wrap up with a little bit of information about the EasyBuild community and how we can contribute to EasyBuild. And in the end, we will do a quick comparison with the main um, competitor tool, let's say to SPAC, and then uh, wrap up with some closing remarks. So practical information, um, as mentioned already, please visit the tutorial website. Um, this, will, this has these slides and also, um, let's say a written out version of the tutorial in text with lots of examples where you can easily copy paste commands or um, other things that will be useful for the hands-on examples and exercises. I will try to show some of the, uh, the examples and exercises myself hands-on during the tutorial, but I'll probably won't have time to cover everything. So some of the exercises in there will be left as exercises um, for you to get some hands-on experience with EasyBuild. And I strongly recommend going through them um, because they're very useful to get a feeling of how EasyBuild works. If you have any questions, we prefer that you use the EasyBuild Slack and more specifically the tutorial ISC21 channel in the EasyBuild Slack. Both Alan and Bart are in there. Um, to help out if there are any problems or questions. Um, and we also recommend using the prepared environment for the exercises because some things have been um, pre-installed in there that make the exercises a little bit easier. Um, otherwise you, you may have to spend some time first to uh, install lots of basic tools like compilers and libraries, um, which would take too long during this tutorial. So for the easy build Slack, the questions that you ask in there, um, please use the threading feature of Slack. So ask a question and then Alan or Bart or maybe somebody else will follow up on that question th through a thread. That's just to make sure we, we keep things manageable in Slack if lots of people have questions at the same time. Um, you should also see some polls popping up in the Slack channel but you can answer with emojis. So each answer has a corresponding emoji and you can just select that emoji or click the emoji if it's already there to um, vote for the poll. So these are very informal um, and just to keep, uh, keep things a bit interesting throughout the tutorial. 
the prepared environment. So again, the details are in the practical info session on the tutorial website. You see the link at the bottom of the slide here. Um, and it was also pasted in the Zoom chat. Um, so you can request an account to get access to the prepared environment. Uh, you will need to pick an account name and a password and make sure you remember that. Um, they, will, they should be approved pretty quickly. And then you can get access either through SSH, um, so password uh, using the password, or through the browser in a terminal um, environment directly in your browser. So that's probably the easiest um, way to access it. And we will we will keep this up until the end of the conference. So let's then move on and get started with an introduction to EasyBuild. If anyone has, has um, problems with accessing the prepared environment, please ask in Slack. Um, and Alan um, can definitely help you out with that. So let's start with taking a look at what EasyBuild is. So we usually refer to EasyBuild as a framework for building and installing software and more specifically scientific software. So it has a strong focus on scientific software on high performance computing systems, so clusters, supercomputers, um, and the performance of those installations um, is very important as well. So uh, that's one of the core um, aspects we pay attention to in EasyBuild. Uh, the EasyBuild code itself is open source, is licensed under GPL version two, um, and the implementation is in Python. It's compatible with both Python 2.7 and a sufficiently recent Python 3. The tool was created um, at Ghent University, so and at the team where I am at, but before I was there. Um, and it was developed in-house for a couple of years before we uh, released it publicly in 2011. And the, the first stable release was done during supercomputing 2011. Um, and since then, a community has grown around it, which is not something we expected or, or wanted to happen. Um, but it did happen, and we're, we're very happy with that, that EasyBuild is now being used all over the world. Uh, the slide on the right also shows some links to the website, the documentation, the GitHub repositories, the EasyBuild Slack, and we have a Twitter account as well. So very briefly, and we'll, we'll gradually unpack this a bit and show it in action and explain the details behind this. Um, but EasyBuild is a, is a tool to install a stack of scientific software in a consistent way and in a way that it performs well. So that's quite important um, in an HPC context. You can see it as a uniform interface for installing scientific software. So no matter what um, software package you are installing, you're asking EasyBuild to install it and it does it for you. And you don't need to know what is going on behind the scenes if, if you're not interested or if there's no need to know. Um, it automates the whole installation procedure, so you don't have to manually unpack torballs or apply patch files or run shell commands and check their output or their exit code. It does all of that for you. Uh, it's usually used by um, HPC support teams or HPC system administrators who manage a, a central software stack on the systems they uh, maintain. But it can also be used by scientific researchers to manage their own software stack in their own HPC account. So it doesn't require any um, admin access or anything like this. Just write permissions to a directory is basically all you need. Um, over time, it has grown to be a, a platform for collaboration between HPC sites around the world. So many people um, from a lot of them in Europe, but also people in, in Asia and, and the US the Americas are, are using EasyBuild and helping out making it better. So over time, it has become an expert system. Many people are, are adding their knowledge, let's say, into the tool and that way helping out each other. Some of the key features of EasyBuild, so it, it fully automates or it, it supports fully autonomous installation of software in general and more specifically scientific software. Uh, it handles the dependencies for you. It generates environment module files. And we'll show how that works and what that means in a bit. Um, it doesn't require admin privileges. I already mentioned that. Um, it's highly configurable. You can easily extend it. So if it doesn't include certain things that you need, um, you can easily add that as a plugin in some sense. 
Um, it supports hooks, so you can customize the behavior of EasyBuild if there's a, something that is missing or that you need for your specific setup. You can easily add that without it being part of EasyBuild itself. Um, it does detailed logging of the installation procedure it performs, and it keeps track of that. So you can revisit that later to figure out what happened or what went wrong. Um, and you can ask EasyBuild what it will do, um, so it's transparent about the the installation procedure it executes and you can get some more information on that if you want to or if there's need for doing so. You can define the way the modules are laid out. So what we call a module naming scheme. Um, it does something by default. You can make it do something else or you can implement your own naming scheme um, if you want to do that. And we'll, we'll show that in this tutorial, what that means and more specifically what a hierarchical module naming scheme is and why that's interesting. Um, it integrates well with other tools like LMOD, for example, the well-known modules tool, but also with the Singularity container runtime, um, with Slurm, so you can uh, basically submit installations as jobs um, to Slurm um, and basically use the power of your cluster to install a large software stack. Um, other tools as well, which I, I won't go into, so it, it also talks to lots of other um, established tools out there to get certain um, things done. It's actively developed and supported by a worldwide community. We have, I uh, lost count, but I think about 20 maintainers, easy built maintainers who look into inter incoming contributions um, and test them and make sure um, they are up to the, the standards that we uh, would like to have for contributions. Um, that goes from people in the US to people in Singapore and everything in between, um, including Bart and, and Alan, for example, are easy built maintainers. Since the public release in 2011, we have done frequent stable releases. Um, about every six to eight weeks, there's a new easy build release, which um, has additional features, some bug fixes, updates for software, and so on. So that's, that has been going on um, at a, a pretty regular pace since 2011. We're pretty serious about testing easy build. So whenever we get contributions, we make sure um, they are either covered by the unit tests or that we test them when they come in. And then we make sure, or we try to make sure that we don't break anything as we make further changes to easy build. And before every release, we also do regression testing. So we try to make sure that things that worked before didn't get uh, broken unless we know about it. And that was a conscious um, decision. There's various support channels for easy build. We have a mailing list, we have a Slack channel. Um, we do conference calls every other week. Um, where we talk about recent developments in EasyBuild, but also where we open up the floor for any questions related to EasyBuild. Um, and the last couple of years, we have done uh, user meetings as well, which have been pretty well um, attended. There are three main focus points in EasyBuild. Uh, one is performance, since we're in an HPC context, that's very important. Um, so there's a strong preference in EasyBuild to compile the software from source code if we, if we get the option to. Um, sometimes we do divert from this if it's too difficult or if there's a good reason to use existing binaries, it's possible that we do that. Or for commercial software, for example, where you only get the binaries, uh, we definitely support that as well. But if we do get the chance or if it's important enough, uh, we do build from source. Um, easy build defaults by optimizing the the software installations for the CPUs of the build host. So if you're building on, let's say, an, an Intel Skylake system, then um, EasyBuild will tell the compiler to also optimize for Intel Skylake. So that's what it does out of the box. You can change that behavior if you want to and uh, do essentially cross compile for other architectures or um, do a generic compilation of the software you're interested in installing. That's possible as well. Um, we have a, we pay close attention to reproducibility of installation. So whenever um, somebody adds support for, let's say, a new software version to EasyBuild, it's typically tested across uh, different systems, different operating systems. Um, and we try to make sure that things are done in such a way that uh, others will be able to uh, perform or yeah, do the same installation as well to basically uh, reproduce uh, the software installation. We're not 
very, very strict about this. Um, so it's like a pragmatic approach to reproducibility. We will certainly not guarantee that you get a bit for bit um, the same installation if you try it on another system. But in general, it works out quite well. And whenever something is supported in easy build, very, usually it just works for others as well. Um, part of the way we do this is by fixing the, the version of the compiler, the libraries, the dependencies of the software and that you are installing. Those are all fixed in easy build. That's deliberate, um, to, especially for the compiler, for example, that's deliberate. So we, we don't use a compiler from uh, your operating system, but the first thing that easy build typically does is build its own version of GCC and then use that to build things like OpenMPI and other libraries and dependencies that you need for your software. So the, initially things may be uh, may take a bit of time to get set up because you usually start with installing a compiler from source, which can easily take over an hour. But once we have that in place, um, the other installations just use that compiler and you're uh, fully started. Certainly today, EasyBuild is a community effort. So the development, the changes we make in EasyBuild, the things we add, fix, update, are highly driven by the community. So we, we get lots of contributions on a yearly basis. We, uh, we merge about 2,500 pull requests. So it's a very active community. Uh, we have lots of active contributors. I think we're, we're over well over 100 different contributors on a yearly basis. Um, and we have some features in EasyBuild as well that, that make it a lot easier to make contributions to EasyBuild as well. And hopefully we'll have the time at the end to get to that. Just to clarify what EasyBuild is not. So it's not a replacement for tools like CMake or uh, Make or Pip. It basically wraps around these tools. Um, if this is the way you're supposed to install uh, a particular software package, EasyBuild just automates that whole procedure for you so you don't have to run these tools manually and figure out how to use them. It also doesn't replace traditional package managers like, like YUM or AFT. Um, so some tools you will, you will still uh, need to install or are expected to install um, through your OS package manager like OpenSSL, for example, for security reasons. Um, you do want to get security updates for this. Um, so this is, you typically still install OpenSSL through uh, your OS package manager. Also system tools like Slurm or um, Luster, so file systems are typically handled still through the OS package manager and not through EasyBuild. And EasyBuild is not magic uh, either. So you, it's possible or actually likely you'll still run into some problems when installing software, especially when you're trying to use new compilers or new software versions that have not been um, tested before. You may run into surprises um, unless somebody has already fixed it for you and it's already supported in EasyBuild, then it should work out of the box. I will actually look at something, uh, an example of a broken installation and how to fix it um, in this tutorial, because that's a very good exercise. Then to, to wrap up the introduction, we'll go over some terminology that we commonly use in EasyBuild. Um, so some of these concepts are very specific to EasyBuild, like EasyBlocks and EasyConfigs have a particular meaning um, in an easy build setting. I will also clarify some other terms like modules, extensions, and tool chains, just to make sure we're on the same page in terms of what these things mean. So first of all, the easy build framework is the, the heart or the core of easy build. Um, it's a collection of Python modules, which are organized in Python packages. So basically collections of modules. Um, and they implement all the common functionality that you need to compile and install software in general and scientific software in particular. So it, it does things like applying patch files, running shell commands, generating module files. Uh, so it has functionality to do all of that. Um, it also provides the EB command. So that's the main, let's say, entry point to EasyBuild. Uh, but if you know a bit of Python, uh, you can also use EasyBuild as a library and leverage it like that. And it lives on GitHub in one of the easy build repositories. Then an, an easy block is a, a single Python module, which implements a particular software installation procedure. So you can sort of see this as a plugin to the easy build framework. It uses all the functionality that the framework provides and it just fills in the gaps basically 
to implement a particular installation procedure. So there's two main types of easy blocks. There's generic easy blocks and software specific easy blocks. Generic easy blocks um, implement a standard installation procedure like running CMake followed by make and then make install. So and configure a build and an installation step um, or how to install a Python package with pip install or Python setup by install. Um, there's an easy block for this as well. And these generic easy blocks can be used for a whole range of different software packages. As long as they follow a particular standard um, installation procedure, you can use a generic easy block. Then there's also software specific easy blocks for more complex software or where things get tricky very fast, even if they use a, a standard installation procedure, but there's lots of configure options, for example, or lots of things to check and verify during the installation, then we, we usually have a, a, a custom or a software specific easy block for this. Examples here are OpenFoam, TensorFlow, Warf. So these are complex enough uh, that they have their own Python module that implements uh, the installation procedure. The procedures that we that are implemented in an easy block can be controlled or steered via what we call easy config parameters. So you basically get knobs that you can turn or values that you can fill in, which are picked up by the easy block and used during the installation. I will see examples of that throughout the tutorial. And I forgot the exact numbers, but I think about 80% of the software that is supported by easy build um, actually uses one of the generic easy blocks. So the Software specific easy blocks are, are for the more complex um, exceptions, let's say. The easy blocks we have centrally live in their own GitHub repository, um, but you can also use your own easy blocks or even use custom versions of an existing easy block um, and basically add it to easy build as a plugin. So it doesn't have to be part of the easy build installation itself. It can live on the side and you can tell easy build to, to use it whenever it needs to. Then um, easy config files. So um, these are basically text files. They're written in Python syntax, but they're, they're not really Python code. Um, so you, you don't have for loops or if statements or functions in there. Um, they basically define a set of variables, which we call easy config parameters. So these are the knobs um, that you can use to, uh, to steer the behavior of an easy block. Uh, they're basically key value definitions. So you, you define values for variables um, and this collection of variables then uh, tells EasyBuild uh, which software version to install, um, which compiler tool chain to use and so on. Uh, the file name of easy config files can be important and we'll, we'll get to that um, a bit later in the tutorial as well. So typically you'll, you'll see that um, Easy config files have this type of naming scheme where the software name dash software version dash a tool chain and maybe a label at the end and it usually ends in .eb. So that's the, the typical name you'll see for an easy config file. Um, but it doesn't have to be like this, especially if you're creating your own easy config files, the, the name uh, doesn't always matter, only in specific um, situations. EasyBuild comes with lots of easy config files, well over 10,000 in the latest version, which all live in their own um, repository and GitHub as well. And similar to easy, uh, easy blocks, um, the easy config files that you want to use with EasyBuild don't have to be part of the installation itself. They can live anywhere. You can have your own collection of easy config files um, for whatever reason and just use those. So you don't need to use the central ones if you don't want to. Then easy stack files are an, a new feature. Um, so I, I won't spend too much time on this here because it's already, it, it's still an experimental feature. So it's, uh, it's already supported in easy build. We don't consider it a stable implementation yet. So we're still playing with this and uh, we might, we may change the behavior, but it's a way of specifying a set of easy config files. So basically describing a, a software stack that easy build should installed so rather than one installation. So an, an easy config file is for one particular installation. An easy stack file is for a collection of software packages that you want to install in one go. Um, so we're, we're, we're creating this, this way of 
expressing what should be installed in an easy stack file. There's documentation on this as well if you want to have more details. Then extensions um, have a particular meaning as well in easy builds. This is additional software packages, typically a Python package, a Perl module in R library. So something you can not use standalone, but you need something else. You need a Python installation or an R installation along with it. Um, we call these things extensions. Um, so that's a general term for uh, these kind of libraries that you have in, in a variety of, of runtime systems. Um, and EasyBuild can install them in different ways, either as a standalone module um, in a bundle, so a collection of extensions together, or as an actual extensions into an existing, let's say, Python installation. So you can install Python together with NumPy, SciPy, Pandas as one um, whole thing and, and use it like this, or you could have a separate Pandas installation on top of another Python installation, but keep them separate. Then dependencies, that this is a well-known concept, of course, but just to clarify uh, here, so a dependency is anything that you, any software that you need to either build something else or use something else, so, so run something. Um, and there's a, a distinction between build dependencies and runtime dependencies. So build dependencies are things like CMake that you need to install something else or pip or package config, or there's lots of tools like this. And then runtime dependencies, of course, are the things that you need to actually use uh, the software. So a, for a Python package, you need a Python installation. So Python is a runtime dependency of, for example, Pandas. There's a distinction between runtime and link time dependencies, strictly speaking, but currently we don't really make that distinction in easy build. So that's a bit um, irrelevant. Then tool chains or compiler tool chains are a specific type of dependency um, in some sense. So a tool chain in easy build is at least a set of compilers, typically C, C++ and Fortran. Again, since we're in an HPC context, um, that's the typical combination of compilers you get. And then on top of that, you can have additional libraries like uh, to support MPI, support BLAST LAPAC, um, so linear algebra functionality or FFT and so on. Um, a toolchain component is then a part of a toolchain, so either the compiler component or the MPI component. Um, when we talk about a full toolchain, we mean both compilers and libraries for MPI, BLAST, and FFT, and Playpack, so the, the whole um, collection, let's say. Uh, but we also have sub -tool chains, which are, for example, uh, only compilers, so no support for MPI or any uh, additional math libraries. And then it's, it's kind of a hierarchy of things, and we will get back to this when we talk to module name about module, hierarchical module naming schemes as well. So these are, there's an order um, to subtool chains coming from compiler only to MPI to math libraries on top. There's also an, what we call a system tool chain that basically means uh, if EasyBuild is using the system tool chain, it uses the compilers that are provided by the operating system. Um, we try to limit this as much as possible because then uh, we don't really have control over the compiler version or how the compiler was built. Um, which may um, affect the reproducibility of the installations that we're doing. So we try to minimize the use of the, um, the system compiler uh, when using the system toolchain. The, most commonly, this is used when building our compiler, building our own GCC version. So we use the system compiler to build our own GCC, but from that point on, uh, we're using um, our own compiler toolchain that we have full control over. Then there's two types of tool chains that you, you will very often see uh, pop up in the easy build community. That's the FOSS and the Intel um, tool chain. The Intel one is pretty obvious. That has the Intel compilers, Intel MPI and Intel MKL. Um, and we have an open source equivalent to that, which is all open source software, um, which is currently, this could change over time, but currently it's the GCC compilers together with open MPI, open BLAST and F50W. And very recently, we've also started using this Flexi Blast library, which provides yeah, an easy way to switch between different Blast and Laypack implementations. So throughout the tutorial, we will be 
using the FOSS toolchain because that's all open source and just easy to get to, easy to install. And then um, modules, so modules are a very overloaded term. Uh, kernel modules, Python modules, there's all types of modules in um, an HPC context. In EasyBuild, when we talk about a module, we usually, we usually refer to an environment module file. So environment modules are uh, a way to specify what should be changed in your environment to activate a software installation. And it's done in a shell agnostic way. So the, the main one, the main types of module files are in either in Tickle or Lua syntax. Um, and a very popular modules tool nowadays is LMOD. So that's the, the Lua implementation. Uh, which supports both uh, Tickle and Lua module files. That's also the default modules tool that EasyBuild uses. Um, if we talk about other types of modules like Python modules, we usually say Python modules. If we just say module, we typically refer to an environment module file. And EasyBuild automatically generates these module files. We'll see that in a bit. So that's a, a whole bunch of terminology. If we all uh, put it together, uh, we get this. So the EasyBuild framework leverages EasyBlocks Python modules, which implement installation procedures. Um, these could involve installing additional extensions like Python packages into the installation. EasyBuild will use a particular compiler toolchain for uh, uh, compiling this software, um, and it will do so as a specified in an EasyConfig file which defines a set of easy config parameters that steer the installation. Uh, when doing an installation, EasyBuild ensures that the, all the dependencies and the necessary build dependencies are already installed. And when it completes the installation, it will automatically generate a module file for each installation. So you get easy access to the software. And then an easy stack file can be used to describe a, a collection of software or a software stack and let EasyBuild install that. So that's a whole bunch of terminology. You, lots of these terms will come back throughout the tutorial, um, but hopefully this clarifies things a bit already. Before we move on um, to installing and configuring EasyBuild, does, are there any questions that people want to raise here in the session, in the Zoom session? So again, if you do have questions, don't hesitate to post them in the Slack channel if something isn't clear. Um, Please ask there and Alan or Bart will happily help you out. There are no questions in Zoom, I'll continue. And we're glad you gradually work our way to getting um, our hands dirty a bit and doing some hands-on work. Before we install EasyBuild, let's uh, make it clear what we need. Um, so we need, Linux as an operating system, typically, which flavor doesn't really matter, easy build should work on, on any of them. Um, it also works on macOS to some extent, um, but the support we have for macOS is pretty basic in the sense that uh, we don't really test a lot of software installations on macOS. So if you try to build GCC, for example, uh, you'll probably get stuck pretty soon. So we don't focus too much on macOS. Um, since we're focusing on HPC systems, uh, which pretty much all of them use Linux as an operating system. Um, you need Python, either Python 2.7 or a sufficiently recent Python 3 version. And obviously we strong, strongly recommend using Python 3 um, since Python 2.7 is, is a dead end. Um, in terms of functionality, it doesn't matter which Python you use. So all the, all the easy build features will work on both. Uh, but to be future proof, we recommend using Python 3. And next to Python, you also need an environment modules tool. So this needs to be available already um, in your um, system. We won't explain uh, how to install that here. That's usually pretty straightforward. Um, there's typically an OS package already available for uh, things like LMOD or the traditional environment modules implementation. Then um, installing EasyBuild, there's different options to install EasyBuild. Um, it's a standard Python tool. So you can just use the standard pip install method of installing the tool that certainly works. Um, if you're not used to using pip, um, usually pip install easy build requires admin permissions to do a system wide installation. 
but it gives you options as well to do an installation in your own user account or to install in a specific location or you could use additional tools like virtual env and so on so we, we won't go through that here um, either uh, you know how this works already or there's lots of guides out there that tell you how to install python tools um, another way is installing easy build as a module so as an environment module um, using easy build itself so this is a bit of a a chicken egg situation but we we describe a, a three-step bootstrap procedure uh, by first doing an easy build installation with pip and then using that one to do the final easy build installation that we want to use and that's also what we'll do here in the hands-on uh, you can also do a development setup just cloning the git repositories and updating your path and python path environment variables um, if you want to start uh, hacking on easy build or making changes to it that would be a good setup so the the tutorial website describes all three in detail has separate sections for all three installation methods but here we'll focus on the the three-step bootstrap procedure so so we get an easy build module as a result to use um, and that starts like this so using pip to do a temporary installation of easy build basic which basically boils down to running these commands now let me switch my view to a browser and go to the tutorial website here installation so here we see there's three methods uh, method one is using pip method two is installing easy build with easy build which is what we're doing here or then the development setup so we'll only look at the bootstrap method um, here and we'll leave the others as an exercise if you're interested in those um, we'll try doing that here in the prepared environment so the people who have requested an account um, should have a terminal um, open already if you're having trouble with that please ask for help in the slack channel um, and I'll, I'll do some hands-on demos starting with installing easy build configuring easy build if you're if you can't keep up with that don't worry too much about this everything is well explained in the tutorial website itself as well um, and this uh, prepared environment will stay up until the end of next week so the end of isc week um, if you want to play with things hands on on your own pace. So let me go back to the slides. So the three step procedure is installing pip in a temporary directory. Uh, for this, you can copy paste the things here and there's this handy copy paste button that you can use to uh, copy paste this and paste it in the environment. So this will do a, a pip installation in a temporary directory, which we control. Uh, and this, this may take a while in this environment because the file system that's available in here is not really quick. Um, and then the second part here, once the installation is done, is making changes to the environment. So you can, you can use this installation. So update path and Python path, and then tell EasyBuild to use the Python 3 commands to run. So this part should be quick and if that worked well then we'll have an eb command in a temporary directory um, which uses python 3 so we can run easy db version for example and it should tell us we have easy build 4.4.0 installed so that's the first step of the bootstrap procedure we have an active easy build installation now but in a temporary directory the second step is then using this um, easy build installation to install our final easy build installation and we will do this in home easy build so we can just run this command eb install latest eb release so this will check in github for the latest um, easy build version that exists and it will go ahead and install that now i already did that um, in this environment here because this takes a couple of minutes and i didn't want to lose too much time so if easy build notices it's already installed it just skips ahead um, and says you you already have this but if you try this yourself you may see that it takes a couple of minutes um, to complete the installation once that is done step two we can jump to step three so now we have an easy build module in here 
we can do, we can check what's installed in here. And we see you have a modules directory, a software directory. And the software directory will have an easy build installation 4.4. In the modules directory, we have an all subdirectory, which has easy build in here as well. So this is the module that we can use to activate, activate our easy build installation. To activate it, we have to tell the modules tool where modules are installed. For this, we use module use, and then we can load the easy build module. Now to show you that I'm actually picking up this final installation, I'll remove this temporary directory. So I will clean up the temporary um, easy build installation that I did. And then which EB will fail on me, then I can pick up the final easy build module. So that's just one way to install easy build and, and get you started um, if you don't have it yet. So we need to tell the modules tool that we have modules installed in this location. And then we have an easy build module available that we can load. It's actually showing me another one as well that's in the prepared software stack, which we'll use in a bit. But if I load an easy build module and I do which EB, I can tell it's the one installed in my home directory and it should be working as well. And module list will tell me that I have one module loaded, the easy build module. So that's, I would say the recommended way of installing easy build, installing it as a module, uh, basically next to your other software that you will be installing with easy build because easy build is also a software package that can be of use um, to the, the people who use the HPC system you are uh, maintaining or you are installing software for. Okay, so that's the three-step procedure. Hopefully, if people are trying that, that should be working. Um, once you have done that, you can verify the installation as well uh, by running some basic commands like eb-version or check the help output, which is pretty long. Uh, you can ask EasyBuild about its current configuration, which we'll do in a bit. Or you can do show system info, which gives you some basic information about the system you are on and what's relevant to EasyBuild. So the OS here looks a bit weird, but I guess this is because it's in this Jupyter environment. Uh, but it also tells you what kind of CPU it found. It can tell it's a Broadwell. That's probably because of an extra Python package I have installed that it actually knows it's a Broadwell. Um, we have two cores available um, and it also tells you which glibc version and which Python version it is using. So that's some useful information. If you see EasyBuild producing this, it's basically working. So your installation has been done correctly. And then something we won't do here now because we already have the latest easy build. If you want to update easy build, um, it depends a bit on how you installed it. If you installed it with pip, you can do pip install upgrade to get the latest version and do an in place update of your easy build installation, which should be okay. Uh, or if you install it as a module, you can just run eb install latest eb release again. Um, and then you will get a new module with the latest version of easy build. So the old one will stay there. Um, and if you don't need that anymore, you can clean it up. Uh, but this is not an in-place update. Maybe you want to switch between easy build versions um, to make sure everything is still working as it was before. Once we have installed easy build, the next important step is configuring um, easy build. So it will work by default as long as you have LMOD as a modules tool, which is Indeed, the case here, if we do module-version, it tells us uh, modules based on Lua, so it's using um, LMOD. Um, if you have that kind of setup, EasyBuild will work out of the box, but it will install um, software into home.local slash EasyBuild, which is probably not the best place, um, especially not on an HPC cluster, since your home directory might be quite small uh, and quite slow. So it, it's strongly recommended that you properly configure easy build before you start installing any software. And to do this, there's a couple of things you should configure. Um, so where will easy build install um, software? Where, where will it generate module files? That's something you should think about. 
and maybe also where will it download any sources so software sources that it needs to install software uh, maybe that's in a different place from where you install software that could be important and a very important one is also which file system should it use for the build directory so where easy build unpacks a source tarball runs lots of compilation commands and then once it has the binaries and the libraries that it needs to install, it will copy those out or install those to the final location and clean up the build directory. Uh, the location of the build directories is quite important because that's an, that could be quite IO intensive. And using um, a shared file system like Luster or GPFS is not a good idea for these build directories. Uh, this has very little to do with easy build itself. But running a make minus J16 in a luster, luster directory, it's quite uh, likely that things will go wrong. So they should be a, ideally a local directory or uh, maybe something in Ramdesk, DevShmem or similar. Um, so there's there's lots of configure set, configuration settings in EasyBuild. We will focus on the most important ones here. Um, and especially the ones in bold, um, we strongly recommend to tweak those in one way or another. So not to use the home.local easy build default. Um, the modules tool and syntax uh, could be important. If you're not using LMOD, you'll have to tell easy build what it should use. Um, so if you're using the tickle based implementation, you'll have to tell uh, easy build to use the tickle module syntax and to use a different modules tool. So more details in the easy build documentation on that. Um, where Easybuild should install software and modules. That's the install part configuration setting, which we'll tweak in a bit. Where it should download source tarballs is another separate um, configuration setting. And the location of the build directories is also a separate one, which is quite important. Um, the other ones we'll skip over for now. Um, these are the ones that you typically see that people tweak once they start playing with Easybuild. Uh, but the ones involved are at least for the, this basic tutorial are the ones we will be changing. There's one useful um, sort of catch all configuration setting, which is called prefix, which controls everything that's uh, marked with an asterisk here. So these four will all be changed at once if you specify the prefix configuration setting, which is what we will be doing in the tutorial. And there's in total, there's about 250 different configuration settings. So very little stuff in EasyBuild is hard coded. Um, but for most things, the default is probably OK. If you want to get more information about what you can tweak or what you can configure, you can check the output of EB help. So to configure EasyBuild, there are three levels, three ways of configuring EasyBuild configuration files, environment variables, and command line options to the EB command. Um, you can configure every configuration setting on, on each of these three levels, so there are no exceptions. Um, and there's a, a hierarchy to this. So whenever you specify something in a configuration file, or let's say both in a configuration file and with an environment variable, the environment variable overrides what's in the configuration file. And the same thing for command line options compared to the other two. Um, and we'll see this in action in a bit. Easy build configuration files to start with our standard INI uh, format configuration files. So key equals value, uh, a quite simple text file. Easy build considers a couple of options or a couple of locations for configuration files, and you can tell it additional places it should look at. Uh, typically, a configuration file is used if you want to configure something for the lifetime of the, the easy build installation that you will use. So basically do it once and then forget about it. If you're not happy with the default, you can change it there um, and then stop worrying about this. Um, environment variables. So every environment variable that starts with easy build underscore will be picked up by easy build and it will try to match this to a configuration setting. If it can't, it will complain and tell you your you made a mistake. Um, so for every configuration setting listed in eb-help, there's a corresponding easy build underscore environment variable. Um, all in capital letters, no dashes, of course, in environment variables um, and prefixed with easy build underscore. So if you want to specify the module syntax configuration setting, 
you define the easy build underscore module underscore syntax in environment variable. So this is a different way of configuring easy build. In, in a sense, it's more dynamic. Um, it's also easy to set and then not have it visible all the time anymore since it's set in your environment. Um, and we see many people creating a small shell script that they then source uh, to, let's say, more dynamically configure easy build. So depending on what system they are on or which account they are in, it, the shell script may be doing different things and setting uh, environment variables differently. This is also the main way that we will be configuring easy build in the tutorial, just because it's, it's quite convenient. And then, of course, you have command line options as well. So any anything you set on the command line will always be honored, no matter um, how easy build is configured through a, a configuration file or an environment variable. But you specify on the EB command line always wins. Um, so there's lots of configuration options, different ways to configure things. So that could be a bit confusing. So we have an easy way to, to check the active configuration. So with eb show config, easybuilt will tell you how it's currently configured. So if we do that here, show config, we haven't configured anything yet up to this point. So this should be showing the default configuration of using uh, home.local. And I guess I already have environment variables defined here. Yeah. So let me unset those. We should build build path to get a clean environment. Prefix. So if you run EB show config without defining any environment variables, this is what you should be seeing. Um, so EasyBuild is telling us it will use the home directory local easy build for pretty much any everything, with one exception, that's robot paths. This is where it, EasyBuild will look for uh, easy config files. So this was by default, it will use the ones in the easy build installation we are using. So this is just a selection of configuration settings, easy build, Things these these are the, the most important ones that you should probably know about. Um, if you want to get the full configuration, you can use show full config, and this will produce an overview of all 250 plus configuration settings and tell them how they are currently uh, set. Okay, so this example of configuring easy builds. It's also in the tutorial website in here. Um, so this creates a configuration file, a very small configuration file, which sets the prefix setting to slash apps. Um, it also sets an environment variable. And then we ask EasyBuild to show the active configuration. And we also tell it on the command line to use a different install path. So if we do this, show config output looks a bit different. So it's honoring all these configuration settings. And as a bonus, it's also telling us on which configuration level each of these things were specified. So it's giving us E for build path because we set the easy build build path environment variable. So show config is very useful both to show how easy build is configured and also how it was configured this way. So with which um, configuration level. So if you're not sure, EB show config and you, you know in a heartbeat uh, what's going on, how easy build is configured. Uh, for the sake of the rest of the tutorial, I'll remove the configuration file and leave the rest in place. We'll slightly reconfigure um, easy build to make sure it's okay for the rest of the tutorial. So this is what we recommend for the rest of the tutorial, the minimal easy build configuration. So you set the build path to temp user, which I already, already did in here. You set prefix to home easy build. So easy build prefix equals home easy build. And this is also, I think in the exercises here, so I'm kind of spoiling the answer here. Um, 
but it's important to have it properly configured. So, so that's the basic configuration, just setting these two environment variables, that's enough. The prefix is telling EasyBuild, please install stuff in home EasyBuild. Uh, with one exception for the build directories, please use the temporary slash temp for that, because we don't want to use um, a shared file system for build directories. That's really enough. Um, there's one more thing. Uh, we have installed a small software stack in this prepared environment in easy build modules slash all. So slash easy build has both modules and software. Um, and we need to tell the modules tool to be aware of these installations. Um, so that's why we use this module use command as well. So it knows, for example, uh, that we have a GCC installation uh, in slash easy build. So you don't have to build GCC from source. That would take a bit too long. So for the remainder of this, tu this tutorial, uh, this is the recommended easy build configuration on slide 39. Then once we have configured easy build and we're happy with that configuration, we can start using it. So the EP command is the, is the main way of driving easy build, using easy build. Uh, you give it command line options. You usually give it the name of an easy config file or multiple easy config files. Or if you don't mind playing with an experimental feature of an easy stack file. Um, and that way you tell easy build what to install. Very often you will also need to enable the dependency resolution. So tell easy build if dependencies are missing, please install these first and then continue the, the final installation that I specified. So for this, we have the dash dash robot option or just dash R for short. And so the typical workflow of using easy build is first finding an easy config file that matches what you want to install. If, that, if it's not there, maybe create one, either starting from an existing easy config file or starting from scratch. And we will cover that in the second part of the tutorial. Uh, you probably want to make sure that the easy config file looks okay, that it has all the dependencies, that you're okay with what easy build or how easy build will do the installation. And we'll, we'll show how you can uh, get some more information on that before actually doing the installation. Uh, you want to make sure your easy build configuration is correct. So check the output of EB show config. And then you go ahead and fire easy build and you go for a coffee, or if it's a big installation with lots of dependencies, maybe you'll need three, two or three coffees. So specifying what to install is usually done through easy config files. So to give you a quick example in here. Um, so this, for example, is an easy config file that I know uh, is included in easy build. This is a very simple one, version 106 of the bzip tool. Um, easy build will go and look for this easy config file, read it, figure out what to do based on that, download sources if it has to, and then go ahead with doing the configuration, the building, maybe the testing and the installation. If it's happy with all of these steps, it will create a module file uh, to complete the installation. And if we have things set up properly, we should, be, we should see the generated module uh, as a result. So this one here in our home directory is what we just installed. So that's the typical usage, EB and the name of an easy config file or the name of multiple easy config files um, to get something installed. Sometimes you'll run into missing dependencies and we have an example of that coming up. And to see which Easy config files, easy build knows about. You can use the search option. So let's look at uh, a recent version of TensorFlow. So does easy build have easy config files for installing TensorFlow? It looks like it has, and actually more than one. The output here is pretty long because it prints the full path to these files. If you use dash capital S, so that's the, the short version of search. Um, it will look a bit more readable. Uh, so here it's telling us, uh, it also gives us patch files actually. 
uh, that are included in the EasyBuild installation. But it tells us, it's telling us I, I found an EasyCompy file for TensorFlow 241 with this particular tool chain and also with another tool chain uh, and a particular Python version and so on. So you already have multiple options here to, to pick and you probably want to figure out what all of these provide. It's giving us other hits here for Hardovot as well, because this is basically a partial match on the name of the EasyCompy file and it's matching on this here as well. You can tweak search a bit. If you only want really TensorFlow, nothing else, you can use regular expressions um, to search. This will not show the Horovod ones. If you don't want to see um, patch files, you can tell that the file name should end in eb or .eb, and then you will only see the easy config files. So depending on what you're after, you can find the output. Before you um, install anything, you can look at the contents of the easy config file. Um, so if you want to get a better view on what this actually contains, show EC or show easy config file, uh, will show the contents of the easy config file. So you don't have to give it the path. Easybuild will search for the easy config file and print the outputs. Now this is producing a lot of output, of course, for TensorFlow. There's a lot of things going on here. For example, we have a whole bunch of patch files uh, to fix either problems in the in the installation procedure or fix bugs in TensorFlow in this particular version of TensorFlow. Um, so this has a lot of information, a lot of detail, but it may already give you some, um, some details on what EasyBuild will do. Like for example, the list of dependencies um, that EasyBuild will use for this TensorFlow installation. And you can see all of these are specific versions. So um, there's very little, very little room for um, things to go wrong here since we fully control the versions of the dependencies and also of the compiler tool chain. And that means the compiler MPI plus layback that's being used. So next to doing a visual inspection of the easy config file itself, you can also ask easy build. Uh, we copy paste it from the tutorial website. Uh, here, I guess. Yeah. So with the dry run option, and let me use the dry run like this or the shorthand minus capital D, um, easy build will give an, an overview of the whole um, installation in terms of which dependencies are needed for this and which ones are already installed. This is already a pretty long list for SAM tools because it includes the compiler tool chain and everything below that. Um, but it will tell you here that most of the things are marked with an X, so they are, they are already installed, except for SAM tools itself. This is not installed yet. So anything but SAM tools is missing here. Now this output is a, is a bit uh, confusing and a bit big. So we have a shorter version, which is dash dash missing or dash capital M. And this will only show what is still missing to be able to install this. So here it says uh, there's 22 modules required, uh, but only one is missing the samples one itself. So this should be pretty quick to install. So that's the dry run option and also the missing dependencies or dash capital M. Yeah, like this. So yeah, depending on this output here, you have a good view of uh, how much work it would be for EasyBuild to get this installed. And you can also inspect the installation procedure without actually doing it. This is a pretty cool feature. So let's do this here for this boost example. Um, so with dash X, or if you're if you like typing extended dry run. Um, you can ask EasyBuild how it would install this without it actually doing the installation. I'm going to pipe this to less because this will produce a lot of output. So if you hit enter in a couple of seconds, EasyBuild will give a detailed overview of how it would install Boost. And it's checking a couple of things in the background now, but it comes back with a detailed answer, a bit of a wall of text which you can scroll through. So it's telling us, um, I want to install this module. 
I will need this source file for that. I haven't found it yet, but I will try to download it from this location and I'll put it here for you. I also have some patch files listed uh, that I will use. And then it explains, I will unpack the source tarball, apply the patch file, set up the build environment by loading these modules and defining these environment variables. And then it will go ahead and run this configure command, run this pretty huge build command and actual uh, several build commands. So not just one, I guess to install different uh, libraries or different versions of the boost libraries. And then at the end, it will also tell us uh, once, once things are done, I expect at least these things to be in place in the installation. Uh, and once it's happy with that, it will go ahead and generate the module file, which will probably look something like this. So all of this is, is not exact, but it, it's good enough. And it gives you a detailed uh, idea of how easy build would do the installation and what, it will, what you'll end up with um, in the module file. So dash X is a very useful uh, option as well to figure out what easy build would do. Yeah, and the slides here basically zoom in on uh, some of that. Okay, any questions until now? So feel free to try some of that in the prepared environment yourself. Uh, I do realize it, it, I may be going a bit quick, but we have a lot of material to cover. Um, and everything is really nicely explained in the tutorial website here as well. Uh, together, even with some exercises to take th things a, a, a bit further uh, beyond the example. And if you click the green box here, it will tell you what the solution is to the exercise. That's a very good way of introducing yourself to easy build. Hey, Kenneth, just, just yeah. to mention, um, some, of the, some of the nodes didn't have some basic packages like patch installed. And I fixed that. So, so if anyone okay. had an issue installing BZIP2, um, you should be able to do it successfully now. Okay, yeah. So apparently there were some OS tools missing that EasyBuild relies on, like the patch command. Um, and Alan uh, should have fixed that by now. So if you saw any problems related to that before, um, that should be okay now. Thanks. Okay, if there's no questions here in the Zoom um, session, I'll continue with uh, a more detailed look at installing software at EasyBuild and also doing some troubleshooting in, things, in case things go wrong. Um, so let's actually do some of these installations in the prepared environment. Starting with SAMTools. So this is an actual scientific software package. So we checked before um, that there was only one thing missing to get this installed, SAMTools itself. Uh, so we can ask EasyBuild to do this uh, installation using the dependencies that are already in place. Now, one detail here is most of what is pre-installed is pre-installed in slash EasyBuild, while we are installing samples in our own home directory here. So we're basically using things that are in, installed in, in two different places. That's absolutely fine. As, as long as EasyBuild can see the modules, that are required for the GCC toolchain or the dependencies that SAMTools has, it's happy. It doesn't really care where those modules are installed. As long as they are visible through the modules tool, EasyBuild can pick them up and um, do this installation for you. So this will take, I think, a minute or two or three to complete. Um, this is a pretty basic installation that all the dependencies are already in place. So that's fairly easy. Uh, but there are cases where this is not the case yet. Okay, so this took about a minute. Um, if we don't have everything in place yet, like for example, with this BCF tools example, so we're again checking the dash capital M or dash dash missing, what is still missing. Here it says two out of three, I cheated a bit. I already pre-installed this GSL one because this takes a couple of minutes. Um, but there's still two things missing, a dependency and BCF tools itself. So if I 
just try to install this. EasyBuild won't be happy. It will tell me it's missing HTSLib. So it will go ahead and download the sources, but then when it tries to set up the build environment, it fails. And it's telling me, yeah, I don't have this module. Um, so missing dependent, missing modules for dependencies and it's happily, or yeah, it's telling me maybe you forgot to use dash robot to enable the dependency resolution. So if we do that, dash dash robot or just dash R for short, we're telling EasyBuild if any dependencies are missing, please install these first and then get back to doing BCF tools. So now we see it installing HTSLib first, and then it will continue to BCF tools. If you try this yourself, it will do GSL as well. And this will take, uh, I think a minute, a minute or three or four. We only have two cores in this prepared environment. So that's a bit limiting, uh, but it should work uh, for you in the end as well. So with, rather than letting this complete, let me cancel it because we see it hanging in the build step for a while and we don't really know what's going on. That's a bit annoying to me. Um, so we can tell EasyBuild to be a bit more verbose and give a bit more information about what it's working on by enabling the trace modes. So we can use dash dash trace on the command line or we can set the same thing through an environment variable. So easy, uh, EasyBuild underscore trace, all caps, equals one or equals any value, doesn't really matter. And then if we rerun with just dash R again, uh, it's gonna give us a bit more information about what it's doing. So rather than staring at a line say, saying building, it's now actually showing us um, what it is doing, unpacking the source tarball, setting up the build environment, so loading a bunch of modules. And then here during the build step, it's telling us I'm running make minus J2, so EasyBuild knows that there's only two cores available. You don't have to tell it that, it figures it out by itself. Um, and that's also why this is taking a little while, of course, to do the actual build. Uh, and the example here, I'm showing the output of PCF tools, not HTSLib, which it's still working on here. So it looks a bit different. But yeah, if you're as annoyed as I am by things taking a while and not knowing what's going on, you can enable trace mode. So once it finishes these installations and I'll let it go here, it's wrapping up on HTSLib, it will do BCF tools next. Um, how do we start using this software once the installation is complete? So again, similar to how we installed EasyBuild, we have a module um, that can be used to activate the installation. Uh, we have to tell the modules tool where the, these modules are uh, located. And once it knows about them, we can load the corresponding modules to get access to the software. So if you're not sure where things are, you can start with looking at how EasyBuild is configured. You are interested in the install path. So that's the location where both software and modules are installed. So in this directory, you'll have a modules subdirectory like this. In this module subdirectory, you have an all directory and then separate ones as well. So these other ones contain symbolic links to the module files in all. That's because you can change the, the view of how modules look in the output of module avail a bit. If you prefer having things in categories like this, you can do it as well. Uh, but for the sake of this tutorial, we'll stick to the standard way of just showing everything at once. Easy built modules all, as it says here. And yeah, we're, we're having both modules in our home directory and in slash easy build. So it's, it's picking up things from two different locations. But if we check for PCF tools, and I think, yeah, LMOD is configured case insensitive here. If we check for PCF tools, we notice we have a module for this now, which wasn't there before. We can load this module. I think this is the one we're loading here as well. Yes. Load this module, check the output of module list. This will tell us BCF tools is loaded. 
but also the dependencies of BCF tools, GCL, HTS lib, and their dependencies together with the tool chain and what that depends on. So this is already a small software stack that we have. Um, and then you can start running BCF tools dash dash version and getting some science done. If you check where this is coming from, it's indeed coming from our home directory and this particular installation. And as mentioned before, yeah, stacking software is, is very, very easy with, with easy build. If we look where our GCC is installed that is active here, this is coming from slash easy build. So this is the, the pre-installed software stack while our own BCF tools installation is living in our home directory till the slash easy build. So it's fine that things are in two different locations as long as the modules are, are visible uh, to the modules tool, easy build is happy with that. Yeah, there's a, a couple of exercises here as well. I won't go through these. I'll leave these as actual exercises for you if you have the time for it. Um, in, in the slides here, uh, we do unpack things a bit more. So the, the installations that EasyBuild does, you go back to a non-trace output. Yeah, like this. But there's a lot going on in the background here. Uh, but the installation procedure is essentially split up into different steps. Um, which always starts with parsing an easy config file. So EasyBuild knows what to do. And then it just goes through the steps of fetching the sources, uh, making sure everything is in place, unpacking the sources, applying patch files, preparing the build environment, then doing the actual configuration of the build, for example, CMake or running a configure script, doing the build step, which is very often something like make or make minus J number of cores. Um, if that completes it, uh, often runs a make test if that is supported by that software. If the tests pass, it does the make install or the installation step into the final location. It may go over a list of extensions to install as well, additional Python packages, R libraries, or things like this. Before EasyBuild declares success, it does a sanity check, um, which means uh, looking for a couple of files that should be there in the installation and very often also running a basic command like dash dash help or dash dash version to make sure that the binaries that are provided are actually working. Um, and if that's happy with that, it will clean up, generate the environment for the environment module, um, making sure permissions are okay and then complete the installation. So this, this whole procedure is defined in the framework, in easy build framework. In easy blocks, fill in the gaps, basically configure, build, and install are always specified in an easy block that is used. And you can tweak each of these steps through uh, environment variables, which are defined in easy config files. So that's how the whole thing fits together. Yeah, this we have already done using software that was installed by loading the module. And we can stack software installations easily by using a central software stack and then installing stuff in our home directory. That works uh, very well and transparent. Okay, then a fun exercise to go through and actually a very useful exercise to go through is to troubleshoot something that goes wrong. Um, so even though installations, especially easy config files that are included with easy build often work out of the box. So we try very hard to make sure they do, um, but there's, there's always a possibility for outside influence or something on your system being different or perhaps being broken um, that breaks the installation. So that means if something goes wrong, it's very important to be able to troubleshoot and figure out what went wrong and how to fix it. Um, lots of stuff can go wrong. You can run out of memory, out of disk space. Uh, one of the shell commands that EasyBuild runs could fail. Uh, there may be a dependency missing, um, either because it was accidentally removed or because EasyBuild doesn't know about it. That's certainly possible. Maybe your compiler crashes with a weird error. Um, so certainly if you're building C++ software and jumping to a new compiler, uh, this will sound familiar. Um, so one uh, thing to keep in mind is that EasyBuild keeps a thorough log while it's doing an installation. So you can dive into this log file 
and figure out what it was doing, what went wrong, what kind of errors popped up and so on. Um, so let's go through the slides here first and then do a hands-on example. Um, so whenever something goes wrong, EasyBuild will produce an error message. Um, so th this is one aspect of EasyBuild that's certainly up for a bit of improvement. So you sometimes you get a bit of a wall of text um, that you have to yeah, go over and try to find the actual problem. So here it's pretty clear. G++, the G++ compiler is telling us this command line option you used is I don't support this. So uh, this, this cannot work. And then if you look at this a bit closer, you actually see it's using user, user bin GCC here, hard coded. So this is the OS compiler rather than the one we provide through our tool chain. Um, so we're essentially using a way older compiler here than we were actually intending. And this could be because this user bin GCC is hard coded in a make file. Um, and we may have to change that or uh, tell it otherwise to use the proper compiler. So this is an example of an error message that's useful because the after staring at, at it for a bit, at least the problem is clear uh, but from the error message itself. But that's not always the case. Sometimes the error easy build just shouts at you and says it's broken and the error itself is actually not included in the error message. And then you have to go ahead and open the log file. So for every installation that I started, easy build keeps track of a log file. The first line it prints is always temporarily log file in case of crash is this location. So you can uh, always open this either during the installation to see what's going on, or if an installation fails, EasyBot will keep this file so you can open it and inspect it um, and see what went wrong. Sometimes you can enable debug mode by enabling the debug configuration setting to get a bit more information. Uh, which may be way too much information because EasyBuild is very verbose in its logging, uh, but that, that may be helpful in some cases. And when an installation does complete successfully, EasyBuild copies the, installations, uh, the installation log file um, to the installation directory itself. So if we look at what we have installed up until now, let's say our BCF tools installation, 1.11, if we check the contents here, we'll see a bin directory and a libexec directory. This is part of BCF tools itself. But there's also an easy build subdirectory, which has a couple of things, including the log file of this installation and the easy comfrey file that was used. And if we look into this log file, so let's open this up. This is very, very verbose, of course. Uh, but we can look, for example, for make minus J. And we can tell um, this command was run. This was the output. So all the individual compiler commands are in here. You can inspect those if you notice something wrong with the installation or you just want to double check how things were done. We can look at the output of the configure command and see what it was picking up there, what it was reporting, and so on. So that's very often that's very useful to figure out uh, what was actually being done during the installation. To navigate these log files, so there's a lot of information in there. So you typically don't want to scroll through them, but search through them, um, either using less and Vim or Emacs or whatever um, is your favorite for opening text files. So Notice that there's a, a well-defined structure to this. So every log message that EasyBuild emits starts with a double equals and a space, followed by a date stamp. So you can use this easily to, to search. Um, there's info log messages. If you enable debug mode, there's also debug log messages. So you can look for this. It tells you um, which of the Python modules um, for from easy build produced the particular log message and on which line the code was running when it was doing that. Um, and it also has these step markers. So whenever it starts a new step, it will emit um, a message like this. So starting something, something step. To go back to the log file here, if I look for starting, let's say build step, 
I should find that here. If I look for starting sanity check. Sanity check. Okay. Test install. Ah, here, sanity check without a space. So that's, here you can see the different steps of the installation popping up um, and easy build producing a bit of information uh, while it's doing that. And if you're looking for actual, usually compiler errors or failing commands, these are a couple of patterns that you, you often see popping up. So it's not always trivial to find the actual uh, problem that caused an error. So it involves a bit of scrolling up and down and looking for particular patterns. But looking for these uh, are very common. Um, a reason why, why a make command, for example, failed. Next to checking the log file, we can also check the build directory. So if an installation fails, EasyBuild will leave the build directory in place. So you can, you can dive in and look at the files that are there or maybe additional log files like the config.log from a configure command uh, and inspect those. Or CMake, for example, has very verbose logging as well. So a fun exercise here, and I'm doing quite well on time. So let me go through it, maybe go through the whole thing. Um, you should definitely try this yourself as well, because it's a very, a very good exercise of, of learning to use easy build hands on and actually running into problems, which is bound to happen when you do your installations uh, yourself as well. Um, so this is explained well in the, uh, here in the troubleshooting section. So there's an exercise here that gives you the contents of an easy config file. So let me go ahead and copy this. And let's call it subread.eb. So the, the name here doesn't really matter in this, um, in this situation because we're gonna give it straight to the eb command. Um, so it, it doesn't need to automatically detect or find this file. Uh, we're basically telling it where it is. So at first glance, this looks pretty okay. Um, I will get back to easy config files later. So this is a bit backwards of doing troubleshooting first, um, but it's more to give you the experience, not to really explain what an easy config file is or how it works internally. Um, but even if you give this to an experienced easy builder, they would say this looks pretty okay and it might it may work. Um, so if you try it, you'll you'll learn that it doesn't work out of the box and you'll run into some problems that you can fix. Let's give this a quick try and see what happens. So we just give the name of the easy config file to the eb command, we hit enter. Easy build parses the easy config file and tries to install this software called subread. So this is an actual scientific software package. Oh, and I still have some modules loaded. That's not very smart. So here it's yelling at me because it says you, you've loaded a bunch of modules um, and that's usually not a good idea. And that's indeed true. I have the BCF tool still loaded. So let me purge my module environment and reload only the easy build module. That should be a bit better. Easy build is happy that the easy build module is loaded, but if it sees something else loaded that is installed with easy build, it, it will yell at you and tell you not to do that. Okay, so starting that again, it's trying to download the source files for subread. So this source file, and it's producing quite a long and perhaps ugly error message, but it comes down to that it couldn't find this source file anywhere. Um, that means it's not already downloaded in my source archive. So here, if I look for subread, I'll just find an empty directory. And that's not surprising because we're not really telling easy build where it can find uh, the source file. The easy config file does have a comment here. So that says we should download this from this location. Uh, that's good for humans, but not really for easy build since it, it just ignores comments, of course. Uh, but we can use this 
list, we can add an additional easy config parameter, source URLs, and use this location in here. Not like that. Let me copy paste this from here, that will be better. So we define this additional source URLs line um, that tells EasyBuild, okay, if you find yourself having to download this file, this is the place you should download it from. Um, and the URL doesn't include the source file name itself, so EasyBuild adds, glues it to the end of it. So let's save this, try it again. And now EasyBuild Easy should be able to download it by itself since it knows where to grab it from. And if it did the download, it will verify that it's the correct one by verifying the checksum. Um, it does that before the unpack. So since it's doing the unpack, um, it seems to be happy with the checksum. Now notice that I'm getting the extra output here because I still have trace mode enabled. If you're not seeing this, you can define this environment variable or you can use eb dash dash trace uh, to get this additional information. So it's happy with the source file, it found it, it unpacked it, and then it barfed again. Then it said no module found for toolchain, uh, GCC 8.5. So let's see what we do have for GCC. We do have GCC 10.2. So let's just switch to that toolchain instead. So we change the version 8.5 to 10.2. We save the file, we try again. Hopefully it gets a bit further now. Yeah, don't forget to do this preparation step here as well if you haven't done that yet. Make sure EasyBuild finds the the dependencies. Um, okay, so now it got a bit further, did the unpack, it did the prepare step. It's happy with that. It tried the build, then it failed horribly. And even though we're seeing compiler commands here, we're not really seeing any real error messages. So it's not clear what is going wrong. But we do have the log file. Easybuilt reminds us here, uh, where the temporary log file is. So we can take this location and open it. And there's actually an easier way uh, to take the location of the last log file. It has, EasyBuild has an option, that's just last log, which will look into the location where EasyBuild puts log files and print the location to it. And then with a bit of, uh, command line magic, we can give this straight to an editor. So vim and then eb last log in a sub command. That way we don't have to keep copy pasting uh, the location to the log file. So this is a log file of our last failed installation. Typically you want to jump to the end of the log file because that's when things went wrong. So I do dollar capital G here and we're back to our compiler command. We have some partial output here, which is not very useful. But if we scroll up a bit, we do see an actual error message here from the GCC compiler. So we tried using dash fast as a compiler option, which is not supported. And it's making the compiler itself is making a helpful suggestion. Maybe you were using or you wanted to use dash o fast. Okay, thank you, compiler, but we'll actually do something else. So let's look again in our easy config file. Uh, do we see fast here somewhere? Yes. So through this build opts easy config parameter, we will we were changing the make command. We were adding stuff to the make command. Uh, and we were hard coding dash fast here, which is clearly a mistake. Um, so we could change this to dash o fast. And that should probably work. But the better solution here is to use the environment variable that EasyBuild sets. So EasyBuild sets not only things like $CC in the build environment, uh, but also C flags to uh, a useful value. 
So we can reuse that that value and add stuff to it. So we have to, have to add the F common because we're using GCC 10 here. Uh, and if we ret retry that, I'm sorry. If we retry that, uh, we'll see that it's using the easy build uh, compiler variables that are prepared in the environment. Now remember to, to inspect the build environment that easy build would set up, we can use db-x. So do the extended dry run and get a detailed report on what easy build will do. And if we do that, look for the build environment that it sets up here, it reminds us what kind of variables it's defining in the build environment. So C flags is one of those. And this looks a bit more useful than um, dash O fast. In particular, MRH native means we're gonna produce binaries that are optimized for our current host, uh, whatever that is. It was a problem, I think. So that's a bit better than OFAST, and it probably will result in a faster installation. So what we're doing with the change I made here is just reusing this prepared environment variable and adding this F common to it because of the GCC 10 compiler we're using. So that should hopefully fix that compiler error. Let's see how far it gets now. And again, this whole exercise here is also in the tutorial website together with the solutions. Um, so I definitely recommend retrying this yourself and getting the full experience. This will take a little while since we only have two cores. The trace output is telling us it's retrying the make command. It looks like it's taking a bit longer. That seems to be good news. That completed exit code zero, so no compiler errors this time. Uh, but things go wrong during the sanity check that EasyBuild does. So it's looking for a bunch of binaries that looks okay. Looking for a non-empty directory that looks okay as well. Um, it tries to run a command dash dash version, and that fails miserably. And we can actually see the the problem here. The feature counts command says. I don't know dash dash version as an, as an option. You'll have to uh, use something I know about. If we open the log file, uh, let me use my last log trick again. You can just copy paste the location of the log file as well. Jump to the end. Then we actually get the full output. If we scroll up a bit, the full output of the feature commands dash dash version. And here it's telling us that dash V is the correct option to print the version. So, okay. I think that tells us what we should fix. If we look back into the easy config file, we see the sanity check command listed here. And rather than using dash dash version, we can use just dash V and that should work. So we save this and we can redo the installation starting from scratch which is a bit silly because we know it compiles, it actually also created the installation directory already, copied the files in there, but it's only this, this sanity check command that was wrong. So does, does that mean EasyBuild has to redo the full installation? No, we can ask it, look, I know the installation is already in place, it's correct. I fixed the mistake in the sanity check. So just check the installation again. And if you're happy with it, then generate the module file. So that's, a special option to the EB command module only. That means skip everything, but do the sanity check. And if you're happy with that, generate the module file. So that should be a lot quicker than redoing the whole compilation from scratch. So you see it's going through the all the steps again, but lots of them are being skipped. It's not unpacking sources. It's not doing the build command. Um, it's only doing the sanity check. And now it's running the fixed command, which Fast okay, it's happy with that. And then it's generating the module file and wrapping things up for us. So that's a lot quicker than redoing the installation from scratch. And once it wraps this up, so again, this is, I think, a side effect of the slow file system, why it's taking so long to wrap up here. But once it comes back, there it goes. Uh, we can check our. 
available modules. We should find one for subread, which was just installed. We can load. Well, just without the version is fine. There's only one. And if we do this, we should have the feature counts come out and we can run dash V ourselves, just like the NFP checked it. So we're pretty sure that this, this will work since it was verified in the NFP check. But that's a very good exercise going through this troubleshooting step and having a couple of things go wrong um, and then trying to fix them. Okay, we're doing pretty well on time. We're almost exactly following the agenda. Um, any questions before we break for coffee or tea or whatever favorite beverage, your favorite beverage is on a Friday afternoon? If there's if there's no questions in the in the Zoom session, we'll do the coffee break now and we'll be back in half an hour. Um, but yeah, do feel free if you have any questions, raise them um, either in Slack or in the Zoom session, and we'll we'll start again in thirty minutes.
Okay, we'll get started again in a couple of minutes. Exactly at quarter past. But maybe somebody has a question already they want to raise in the Zoom session. We should have time at the end as well for questions if people are have a burning question or sometime, something that's maybe a bit out of scope for the agenda. We'll definitely take those questions at the end as well. For the people who are playing in a prepared environment um, that will be available until the end of next week, so the end of the ISC week. One small detail to keep in mind is that if you start a session, it's basically active for five hours. So if you're spending more than five hours in there, uh, you'll have to restart it. So take that into account. It's basically a, a bash session in the Slurm job. You're playing around. Okay. I'm assuming my, my screen share is still up. Zoom isn't showing me the, the border anymore, but unless somebody shouts at me for not showing my screen, I'll continue. We're doing quite well in terms of time. Let's see if we can keep that up and stick to the schedule. I hope we can get through uh, all the content we have in mind here. So the next bit is about module naming schemes and hierarchical module naming schemes. So we'll go over that now. So what you've seen up until now when we install easy config files and we get a module file um, for that installation, it ma matches very closely with the name of the easy config file. So we get name slash version dash toolchain and maybe a label at the end. Um, that's what we call a flat module naming scheme. Um, and there's another uh, type of, of module naming scheme, which is a hardcore module naming scheme that's very different. So let's, let's try and explain what that is. Uh, the default one, the easy build MNS module naming scheme is a flat one that basically mimics the easy config file names. It just adds a slash after the software name rather than a dash in the file name and the easy config file name and it strips off the .eb extension. 
Um, this is a flat module naming scheme because first of all, there's a clear mapping between easy config file name and the module file. Um, but also if you do module avail, you'll see all modules um, at once. So if we do this in the prepared environment here, assuming I do the module use of the centrally installed modules. So you'll see this is a long list and some of these names are quite long. Um, all of them mention which, which tool chain was, in, was used to install them, except the ones installed with the system tool chain, which are just OS tools, so not a proper easy build tool chain. Um, so that's a bit yeah, daunting, maybe ugly even to have names that long. And also having everything visible and available for loading at once is a bit, um, first of all, yeah, getting an overview of what's installed is a bit difficult. But if you have stuff installed with different compilers, which is not the case here, but it's very easy to have things installed with different compilers, um, it can be very hard to combine those and not run into trouble. So even though all these modules are available straight away, it may not be a good idea to uh, load them together in the same session. So that's a bit unfortunate that there's no hints in terms of what is compatible with, with um, each other. Um, so the, these two main problems, long uh, module names and having everything at once um, available for loading, even though it may not be compatible with each other, there's a solution for that, which is called a module uh, hierarchy of a, or a hierarchical module naming scheme. So there's, there's different ways of doing a module hierarchy, but the typical one has has a three level hierarchy where there's a core level um, and this and the core level things like compilers like gcc or intel or whatever compilers you're playing with um, are installed and these are things that are typically installed with a system tool chain so not with a con with a tool chain controlled by easy build but something that is using uh, the compiler from the os to build this particular software the compiler, a compiler installed with EasyBuild is a typical example. Then on the compiler level, you get modules or libraries or tools that are installed with a compiler only tool chain controlled by EasyBuild. So here in this example, OpenMPI and MPitch to MPI libraries were installed with this particular version of GCC. And then there's an, another level, an MPI level, where software that is installed with both a compiler and a particular MPI library are located. Um, so that the ones at the bottom here, FFTW, Scalapack, and HDF5, were both or were all three installed with OpenMPI and GCC. Uh, so with these two particular modules. So these GCC and OpenMPI in this case are, are what we refer to as gateway modules. So they, they provide access to additional software installations. This is very different from a flat naming scheme um, in a number of ways. Like the, the, the entries you see here in the, uh, in the circles, well, they're not circles, but close enough. Um, these are the actual module names. So you just get software name slash version and nothing behind it. So the module names are quite um, short um, and clean. And what they were installed with in terms of toolchain is implied in the location that they are located in. Uh, so that, that helps a lot. So there's pros and cons of both actually. Uh, with a flat naming scheme, um, all the modules are visible. So you can get easily hundreds or even thousands of modules that are visible. Um, and especially uh, people who don't really know what they need and are just looking around doing a module avail without any additional um, arguments uh, get to see all these modules and this can be quite overwhelming. Uh, so that's a downside. The upside is, is if you do module avail and something is not there, you know it's not there. So there's no way or yeah, no obvious way that it's it's hidden or unavailable, um, at least not without taking additional features into account of the modules. Too. So in the flat naming scheme, module names are unique. So there's a direct, direct mapping from at least if the module naming scheme is, is designed well, there's a direct naming, a direct mapping from easy config file to module name and the other way around. Um, the module names are long and maybe even ugly, which can be confusing. So you get these GCC uh, or FOSS or GOMPI tags in there, so names of tool chains, uh, which can be very confusing and 
gets in the way more than it is useful, but it's a necessary evil with a flat naming scheme. And again, yeah, loading modules together may cause problems if you're not careful. So loading things with different compilers, uh, you may run into surprises and, and broken things uh, because you were not careful. In the module hierarchy, you get sh short module names. So it looks a lot cleaner. Um, and the tool chains are sort of hidden. So they're, they're encoded in the location where modules are installed. Um, so that helps with keeping it clean. Uh, but the, the downside is, is that if you do module avail, you don't see everything that's available. And we'll see this in action in a bit when I do the, the hands-on demo. Uh, so LMOD is a modules tool that, that was actually built uh, from the start for supporting this hierarchical module naming scheme type of approach. Um, and next to the module avail command, it also has a module spider command to look through the hierarchy and see what's available where and, and how that can be accessed. So um, module spider is mostly useful in, in a module hierarchy and you actually need to use it to be able to find modules. Um, Elmod is also very smart. If you have the same package installed with a different compiler MPI combination. So let's say you have HDF5 installed with GCC9 and OpenMPI4 and another HDF5 installed with GCC10 and OpenMPI3 or whatever makes sense. Um, Elmod is smart enough that if you load a different compiler, it will actually swap things around for you. So you get access to the, the corresponding HDF5 that was built with that compiler. Same thing with, with MPI. Um, that's very useful if that's what you expect, but if you don't expect this, it can be very confusing. Uh, so that's a bit of a, both a positive and a negative point. Uh, the, the very good point next to the short module names is that if you can load modules together, that means they are compatible with each other. So there's, there's no way that you can accidentally uh, load modules that were built with different compilers because they're located in different places. And unless you try very hard, you will not be able to load them together. And the, the gateway modules like the GCC and MPI, and this will become more clear in the demo as well. Um, that's also a bit of a necessary evil, let's say, in a, in a hierarchical module naming scheme. Um, so end users are forced to load a compiler and an MPI first before they get access to the actual software they care about. Um, so this may be a, a bit uh, confusing or may have little meaning depending on how um, experienced your users are. Um, there's multiple module naming schemes supported out of the box in EasyBuild, uh, but you can also create your custom one, your own custom one. So you can write a small Python script or Python class actually uh, that derives from uh, this module naming scheme abstract class. You can define a couple of methods um, that explain to EasyBuild how modules should be named based on software name, software version, tool chain, and whatever else is available from the EasyConfig file. And you basically make something that spits out the string and that tells EasyBuild this should be the module name uh, I want to use. Uh, we won't actually go into implementing a custom module naming scheme here, even though it's covered in the in the tutorial website. There's a separate section, a small section on how to implement your own custom module naming scheme that does everything lowercase and something silly like replacing all dashes with underscores, uh, something along those lines. So. As long as you know a bit of Python, you can make EasyBuild do anything in terms of how modules are named. So what, what I'll do here, because this gives an, a good idea of how a module hierarchy is different, um, is I'll look into installing HDF5 and using a hierarchical module naming scheme. And that way you will uh, hope it will hopefully become more clear um, how things are organized and how that's different from a regular flat naming scheme. Um, we do have to be a bit careful when doing this because one thing you can definitely not do is mix modules that are installed in a flat with other modules that are installed in a hierarchical module naming scheme. So you, you cannot easily combine both because some modules like the gateway modules, for example, GCC, will have the same name in both the flat and the hierarchical module naming scheme but the contents of the module files are different. They do different things. So if you accidentally pick up one rather than the other, things will just fall apart and, and will not work properly anymore. So you have to avoid mixing modules. Uh, that's one thing. And 
an additional thing is that you have to reconfigure easy build a bit first of all to use the different module naming schemes so that's this um, environment variable but that's defined so we'll use this hierarchical mns that's included with easy build and in this particular case we just want to play with the modules themselves we don't want to rebuild all this software so what we want easy build to do is we're going to tell it look the software that we want to use is installed in slash easy build slash software which is already there everything is pre-installed but we want to generate the modules for this in a separate location in our home directory slash hmns and what we will do is we will tell easy build to just only generate the modules for these installations so not to rebuild all the software we're talking about 41 modules by the time we have hdf5 and all dependencies and compiler toolchain and mpi um, installed so we don't want to do this from scratch this, this would take a couple of hours uh, but easy build is smart enough to reuse the installations that are in here and only generate a different view on those installations by generating different modules and that's what we're going to make it do in in this particular demo okay let's try and get that to work um this is the example part here and i think it explains it quite well how to set things up so to start with you have to make sure that your environment is clean so there should be no modules loaded and the modules tool should not know about any modules at all so if you type module avail it should come back empty so you can do that by running module purge and module unuse module path. So this is the environment variable that the modules tool keeps track in where modules are located. If we do this, module list should come back empty and module avail should come back empty as well. That's exactly what we want here. Now we, we do have a small problem. We had easy build installed as a module, which is now no longer available for loading. So how we will be able to run easy build. Um, if you're really serious about using a module hierarchy, you would first start with installing easy build in that hierarchy, load that module, and then continue from there. Um, I won't do that here, um, even though it's quite easy. I'll, I'll take a shortcut in some sense and just use a, a pip installed easy build in my home directory. So I'll copy paste this, uh, which essentially just does a pip install of easy build in my home directory. So that's the user will go to uh, dot local in my home directory, and I'll use this uh, as the easy build, easy build installation I want to use. Here I'm just making sure the eb command is available, and this one tells easy build to use Python 3 um, to run easy build itself. So hopefully that shouldn't take too long. And I can continue. Um, and after we get an active easy build again that we can use, um, outside of a, a module system, uh, we also have to be careful about how we configure easy build. So we're going to tell easy build to use home easy build as before as the prefix, the build path set to temp, even though we're not actually going to build anything in this demo, but we make sure it's properly configured. Um, we tell easy build to use the hierarchical module naming scheme. That's important, of course. And we tell it to reuse the software. Uh, the pre-installed software that's in slash easy build slash software so easy build will look there and expect thing expect to find things there already pre-installed and then the modules that we're going to generate uh, in this hierarchical structure will be located in dollar home slash slash hmns so we're going to copy this and once this installation finishes uh, we'll configure easy build that way um, if we've done that correctly and we run eb show config that should return an answer like this so this has a a little bit more output than before because we're we're defining more configuration settings we have a separate location for modules and software so that's new the module naming scheme is also new that was not there before because we were using the default so just setting these environment variables and then running show config should pretty much produce exactly the same thing we have here, well, except for the username part, of course. So that looks pretty good. Software comes from the central location, which should be here. So there's a whole bunch of stuff pre-installed here, uh, but we don't have any modules for those 
uh, yet. And we'll make EasyBuild generate those for us. So what we want to do is generate modules for this easy config file for HDF5. We want to make sure EasyBuild does all the dependencies as well. So there's remember, there's nothing there, not even a module for the compilers uh, or the tool chain. And we'll tell EasyBuild only do the modules. Trust me, the installations are there. And EasyBuild will actually check whether the installations are there and whether they work. Because when using module only, it will still do the sanity check. So it will actually verify that things are in a functional state rather than just generating the modules. If, if you do that in a prepared environment, this will generate 41 modules. Um, each of these takes a matter of seconds because it's not actually installing anything, but it is doing the sanity check and generating the module file, doing a test load of that module and, and checking a couple of things. So it does take a couple of seconds. Times 41 means a couple of minutes. So I, I cheated a little bit here and I've pre-installed some of these modules already in this HMNS directory. But if I ask EasyBuild what is still missing, so dash capital M or dash dash missing, it will tell me, I think one or two or three are still missing. So even if I run this command, it will still do something useful. Yeah, so it's telling me I don't have the module for HDF5 yet. And look how this is pretty different, the output than before. So this is the name of the actual module file. Let's say the user facing name of the module file. And this is the location that EasyBuild will put it in. So here we can already see this uh, structure. This is the MPI level because HDF5 needs both a compiler and an MPI. And this SZIP dependency 211 will be installed in the compiler level because this doesn't depend on MPI. So it goes up, let's say, in the middle of the hierarchy, the compiler only level. So that's just me cheating a bit to avoid that EasyBuild has to generate all these modules. Uh, so what I'll do, I'll do robot. So it does both uh, the missing SZIP dependency and HDF5 itself. And I'll do module only to only generate the modules. So this should be pretty quick since it only needs to do two, uh, two modules. Again, because of module only, it's skipping the actual installation. It's expecting things to be there. It is doing the sanity check. So it is verifying that we have access to a working in this case, SIP installation, and it's doing the same for HDF5 itself as well, uh, which will be installed here. Or yeah, at least the module will be installed in this location. That's all looking good. It's about to finish. And then we can check how things actually work from a user point of view. So that wrapped up the installation of those modules. Now, EasyBuild has installed stuff, but we still haven't set up our modules tool. We still haven't told our modules tool where things are. So that's the starting point to get access to these installations. The module files are generated here. And you can see the three, the three levels of the hierarchy here, the core level, which is where compilers live or anything built with system toolchain, the compiler level where things live that were installed with only a compiler toolchain, so no MPI and everything else basically goes in the MPI level. So if we're looking for HDF5, that will be located here. In the MPI level where things are located, compiled with the GCC 10.2 and the open MPI 4.05. And in here, we'll have the HDF5 module, which only has the version. Okay, but now how do we tell the modules tool about this? So step one is starting at the top of the hierarchy. So this is not the modules all directory, but the core subdirectory in there. So this one has things like our GCC compiler and the dependencies for um, installing that. So we start, starting point is this module use command module use location of modules slash core, the top of the hierarchy. If we now run module avail, we'll get a couple of modules available, including our GCC compiler. So this is the gateway module that we'll use that will provide access to the rest of the hierarchy. Um, 
And yeah, the other ones are basically either dependencies for this GCC or just things that we have installed, like the tool chains themselves are not installed with a particular tool chain controlled by EasyBuild. These are just module files. Uh, there's no installation behind these, They're just collections of other modules. Now, that's all good, but we actually want to have HDR5. If we run HDR5, avail HDR5, Almod says, I don't have this. Uh, at least I don't have this available for loading straight away. Um, but we can use the module, the spider tool that Elmod provides and ask Spider, do you know of any HDR5 module anywhere in your hierarchy? And Elmod says, yes, I know about 1107, HDR5 1107. And I know that you'll need to load these two modules before you actually get access to that. So it's smart enough to know about the structure of the hierarchy. And it's smart enough to know that there is an HDR5 built with GCC 10.2 and OpenMPI 4.1.5. Okay, that looks good. So we can, we can follow those instructions. We can start with loading the GCC version, check module avail again. Well, this is not good enough because we don't have MPI loaded yet. But if we check module avail again, we now see these were already there. We have additional modules um, available. This looks like two levels of a hierarchy. It's really not. This is one whole level, but we, we use um, different subtool chains here with easy build, so things are a bit more spread around. But the one that we care about is the second gateway module for OpenMPI. So remember, Elmot was telling us uh, with Spider, I can run that again. Here, the ones it's listing here are the ones that give access to the software we care about. So these are what we call the gateway modules. And right now, with module list, we only have the GCC one loaded, not OpenMPI yet, which is why if we ask module avail, what is available for loading, it doesn't know about AGF5 yet. If we do load OpenMPI, and check module avail again. There's another box of modules that is opened in the MPI level. And now, of course, module avail HDF5 will come back with an answer that we do have a HDF5 available for loading. So we can go ahead and load this. If I can type, uh, well, tab completion well, helps. Um, so this is available for loading module list. Looks very clean. Just software name slash version. This looks a lot better than in a flat naming scheme. And we can actually uh, access one of the HDF5 tools, HDF5 dump, H5 dump, for example. If we check where this is installed, this is coming from slash easy build software. So nothing was reinstalled here. Um, easy build just generates a new module tree for existing installations. Yeah, so that's what this whole example is about. There's an, an exercise in here as well that basically redoes this for a different software package. Uh, this SciPy bundle, which is a bundle of NumPy, SciPy, and Pandas, uh, which has a, bun a bunch of missing uh, modules. So the installations, again, let me check with EB. Um, the installations again are there already, but the corresponding modules are not available in this module hierarchy yet. So if you do uh, something very similar like I did with HDF5, um, it should come back with an answer. It's screaming at me here for having modules loaded, but in this case, I don't really care. Oh, and it is finding everything. Ah, okay, that's because I have the prepared um, HMNS already in place. So if you do this, you should see things are still missing for doing this exercise and you can try it yourself. So hopefully that makes it a bit clear what the um, deal is with a module hierarchy and why it may be interesting. Uh, but again, there's pros and cons about both uh, approaches. So there's no clear winner here, at least not, uh, not to me. Kenneth, there was a question about um, module naming schemes and if you're using packaging. 
Um, so what's, what packet, what, if you're using RPMs, if you're creating RPMs you build, how, how does the packaging of modules work? Okay, that's a very good question. Um, I don't use the packaging feature myself a lot, so I actually have to think about it. I think in the in the packaging support, um, we we only support basically one module tree per installation right now. So you, you can't really package modules separately from installations, I think. So that's something we would have to work on. Um, so if you use, so with, with packaging support, let me show it in the documentation. Um, so Easy Build can talk to uh, this other tool called FPM, Fing Package Manager, uh, where you can tell Easy Build to bum, 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 here EB dash dash package. So if you do this, Easy Build will not only install this particular software but then also talk to FPM to get an RPM for it that you can install. And I think currently the RPM includes both the installation and the module file, and there's no easy way to, to pull that apart. So that's something we would have to work on. I hope that answers the question. So the packaging support we're not really going to cover in here. It's a it's a pretty stable feature. It's been around for quite a long time, and I know several people use it and are quite happy with it. Um, but yeah, there could be gaps in there in terms of what is uh, what is supported. So we could work on that. Okay. If there's no burning questions for now, I'll continue and look at how we can add support for additional software. So easy build out of the box um, comes with support for a whole bunch of software. I didn't include the link here, I probably should have, but it's actually better I think through the website. So we have a list of supported software here. If you go to easybuild.io, there's an easy link here, which brings you back to the documentation. And this has an yeah, well-organized list of all the software that is installed currently in the latest Easy Build release. So over 2,300 software packages, including tool chains and bundles of things. Um, and you will find something like TensorFlow in here somewhere. There it goes, so it's sorted alphabetically. And all the versions that we support for TensorFlow and for which compiler tool chains we have easy config files included with Easy Build itself. So this is definitely one of the things that, that moves pretty fast. So with every easy build release, we get easy config files for new software versions. TensorFlow 2.5.0, for example, will be supported in the next easy build release. So this is a very long and detailed overview of what's already there. Let me jump here as well to the next part. Um, but if there's something that you want to install that is not supported yet in EasyBuild, this could be a totally new software package that EasyBuild doesn't know about yet, or it could be a new version of something that's something that's already supported. Um, that's what we're going to look at now. So for every installation that EasyBuild performs, there has to be a, a corresponding Easy Config file. So that's how you tell EasyBuild what to install. Uh, this could be included with EasyBuild itself, or somebody could give you an easy config file that worked for them, and you can try using it. Um, if not, if you're on your own, let's say, you could either take an existing easy config file and change it until it installs what you wanted to install, like a different version, like a slightly different configuration, um, or you could create one from scratch yourself. When Writing an easy config file, you're you're going to need to use an easy block, uh, or you're going to have to tell e easy build to use an easy block. Um, and again, I think for about 80% of the easy config files, one of the generic easy blocks that we have um, is sufficient. So again, the documentation has a detailed overview of certainly generic easy blocks. There it goes. Overview of generic easy blocks. That's, let's say, what is this, 20, 30 different ones. For example, uh, let's say configure make. So that one does configure make, make install. 
and you get a couple of um, easy config parameters specific to this easy block, like uh, if you want to change make install to something else, you can redefine or you can define this install underscore command easy config parameter in your easy config file and then easy build rather than using make install to install the software, it can use a different command. So you get knobs um, to, to tweak, uh, to steer the installation. Now, very often a generic easy block is enough, which means you don't have to do any real Python coding to get something, get something installed, that's very useful. But if the software is quite complex or have a very, has a very specific installation procedure, uh, if they were reinventing CMake or have their own configure script that does something very different from a, a regular one, um, you may need to um, implement your own um, easy block. So e implementing easy blocks is, we can't really cover that here um, in this tutorial. That's a, that's a bit too advanced for, um, let's say a, a basic introduction like we have here, but this is well covered in the documentation. And we also have a previous version of this tutorial has a separate section on implementing easy blocks with an actual exercise for that. So you could take a look um, at that particular version of uh, the tutorial. What we will do here um, in the demo, I will create an easy config file from scratch, step by step, and basically show you how that process goes and how easy build sort of pushes you in the right direction. Uh, to make that work. Before we do that, uh, to clarify a bit, um, when do we need a custom easy block or when can we use a generic easy block and a relatively simple easy config file? Um, that's a bit of a difficult question. The, the answer is it depends a lot on the software you're installing. Um, sometimes you can get away with a very fat easy config file where you're defining lots of easy config parameters and maybe where some of them may have to change if you change a tool chain or, or use a different version of a dependency. So the more you're, let's say, fixing or hard coding things in an easy config file, um, the more you're, you're maybe going towards a custom easy block that could be a better solution. Um, or sometimes you really need to do things that are a bit too advanced for an easy config file, like running interactive commands. If you have a configure script that asks, asks you questions and you have to answer those, those questions supposedly interactively, that's too much for an easy config file, but in, a, in an easy block a Python script, essentially um, in Python code, you, you can do all of that quite well. And easy build, the easy build framework gives you functionality to facilitate that as well. Sometimes it makes sense to, um, to add some logic in the easy block that reacts to the tool chain. So if it notices you're using a GCC compiler or an Intel compiler, uh, it can basically create the corresponding configure options for you. Uh, so you don't have to do that manually anymore in the easy config file. Same thing for dependencies. If for example, you have HDF5 loaded or included as a dependency, the easy block could know, oh, that means I have to do with HDF5 equals location to that HDF5 installation. And then you don't have to do that manually yourself in the easy config file. So by creating a custom easy block, you, you can take away some of the logic and, and make it more dynamic, make it um, derive all that stuff yourself. So yeah, there's a bit of a, a thin line here, um, but very often, you, you notice yourself if you go too far or or uh, too sorry too deep in an easy config file. Um, it may be better to write an easy block, but then you'll need to do a bit of Python coding. For now, we're going to stick to pure easy config files and leveraging an, a generic easy block, so we don't have to do any real Python coding. What's important here? So an easy config file is essentially a bunch of variables you define which we call easy config parameters. Um, it's in Python syntax, but it's not really Python code in the sense that you won't be doing any logic like functions or for loops in there. Um, you're basically doing key value definitions of uh, uh, easy config parameters for telling easy build what it should install and which dependencies, which maybe configure options it should use for that installation. There's a couple of things you have to define in every easy config file, so these five, software name, software version, 
uh, homepage for the software, a short description of the software, and which toolchain should be used to do the installation. That's the bare essentials. Uh, you may say, well, stuff is missing here, like sources. Don't you always need sources? Not really, because you can write an easy config file that just combines different modules, different existing installations together to make it to make them easy to load. Uh, like, uh, let's say the, the FOSS toolchain, so the combination of GCC, OpenAPI, OpenBLAS, FFTW, um, has a corresponding easy config file, but, but which doesn't install anything, it just bundles things together. So in that case, there's no source files involved at all. Um, of course, yeah, having sources is very common. Having a telling EasyBuild where to download them from, so specifying source URLs is very common. You often see patch files um, being specified as well, like we saw in the TensorFlow example. Usually for both sources and patch files, we have checksums in place, so we make sure that uh, the source tarball you obtain is actually the correct one and it's not a corrupt download or uh, uh, something that was provided maliciously to make you try and make you install something uh, that you don't want to install. Um, so that's related to sources. Um, often, especially when using a generic easy block, you'll have to tell easy build which easy block you want to use. If you don't specify which easy block you want to use, then easy build is going to try and derive the easy block from the software name. So that means it's going to look for a software specific easy block. If you do name equals TensorFlow, easy build will say, okay, you're not telling me which easy block I want to use. So I'm going to look for an easy block specifically for TensorFlow. And if it doesn't find that, it will give up and scream at you. Specifying dependencies or build dependencies like CMake is very common. Um, using the config opts or pre-config opts in uh, easy config parameters for controlling the configure command. And then the same thing for build, same thing for install is quite common as well. And we'll see that in the demo. And also customizing the sanity check. So making sure that the things that should be there are there or that simple commands like dash dash help or dash dash version are working as expected. Um, this can be specified via the sanity check um, easy config parameters as well. So those are the more, more common ones. There's a, a long list, uh, which I didn't actually mention here, but you can ask easy build about all the easy config parameters it knows about with EB dash A, which is short for available easy config parameters like this, I think. But EB dash A is a lot easier to type. This will produce a lot of output, but this tells you, for example, uh, let's take a good example here. Like pre-built ops says extra options that are pre-passed to the build command and same thing for config, same thing for install step and so on. Easy block is used to specify which easy block should be used for the build. And if it's not specified, easy build will determine that via the software team and so on. So this is a long list, relatively long list. Um, it's not actually a complete list even because for specific easy blocks like configure make, let me pass that through less. So here we're asking EasyBuild, give me all the easy config parameters you know about and include the ones that are specific to the configure make easy block. In that case, you'll get a couple more in here. So a list of easy config specific, easy config parameters like the one I mentioned before, install command, which lets you change make install to something else. So EasyBuild knows all the easy config parameters. It yeah, it can take into account. Um, if you define anything else in an easy config file, and I'll show that during the demo, um, EasyBuild will scream at you again and say, look, you, you're defining a variable, but that's meaningless to me. So I'm just gonna ignore it. And that's probably not what you want to do. Yeah, we'll get back to the rest of the slides later. I'll Check the example here. So there's mandatory parameters. We been over those commonly used parameters like source files, patch files, checksums. That looks like this in an easy config file. Specifying the easy block. So just giving it the name typically of a generic easy block. Uh, 
And examples are configure make for configure make, make install, CMake make for the same thing, but with CMake rather than configure for installing a Python package, which can do Python setup by install or pip install. And you can control which one you want to use by setting the appropriate parameters or a bundle of things like just slapping things together without an actual real installation. Uh, so those are pretty common uh, generic easy blocks. They're just a couple of examples. Uh, you can also ask on the command line which easy blocks are known and it will give you an, a nice overview of that. Uh, custom easy config parameters with just shown. So some of them are custom to specific easy blocks. Um, dependencies follow a syntax like this. So dependencies is always a list of things. Um, and each dependency is uh, this tuple syntax in Python, uh, which has at least two string variable through string values, the name of the dependency and the version of the dependency. It could have additional values for the particular dependency like this part where we say name version, and this is the version suffix uh, that we want to use for this particular dependency. But name version is what you typically see. Uh, version suffix, I'll mostly skip. This is like adding a custom label. Um, if you're doing something special to the installation, like using a different configure option, you could give it also a version suffix to discriminate between the different installations easily. Like we do with, sometimes we do with Python, for example, Python 2, Python 3 installations have a different version suffix. Oh, and here we're using what we call a, a template. So rather than hard coding 2.7 in here, we're basically telling EasyBuild, uh, please replace this by the first two digits of the version in whatever Python dependency is being used. So we, we try very hard to, to not hard code the version in multiple places, which makes it a lot easier to change an existing easy config file. Yeah, customizing the configure, build, test, install commands. We have these uh, easy config parameters for that config opts, build opts or pre built opts, and install opts. So these tweak the corresponding uh, commands in that particular step of the installation. Like with this config opts line, we're basically telling easy build, please do this. So add this option to the configure command. And this part is done by the easy block itself. So dash dash prefix will always be specified, um, but we're telling it to also add this additional configure option. Pre-built ops is a bit different. This basically gets glued before the build command. And that's why we're using this double ampersand here at the end. So we're, we're basically chaining multiple commands and we're making sure that if this command fails, which it probably can't, um, if this command fails, EasyBuild will give up at that point and not do the second part of the build command. So with this line, we're essentially making EasyBuild do this. So this part is specified in the easy config file and the configure make easy block in this case will do this by itself, run make after checking how many cores it can use to do the build. And very similar install opts leads to this. And then another important one is the sanity check. So here, uh, being a bit familiar with Python syntax helps, I guess. So this is a, a Python dictionary. So a mapping of key to some value. And there's two parts in the sanity check. The, the parts that are expected in the installation, so files and non-empty directories, or commands that should be run and should pass correctly. So it should produce an, an zero exit code. That's very uh, useful as well. There's lots of other easy config parameters you can define, which we will not go over. These are definitely more, the most common ones. Um, so before I go to generating easy configs and copying easy configs, let me step through an example here. Because I think that will help in uh, making things a bit more clear. 
So what we've done is we've come up with our own small software package, which we call EB Tutorial, um, for which we provide a source tarball here at this location. So it's in the GitHub repository, but you can download it straight from GitHub using this URL. Um, this is version 101. So we're, we're gonna try and convince EasyBuild to install this. Now you can look at the sources unpacked in the repository. Um, so this gives you some hints. It even has a nice readme file that tells us to do sudo make install. That's probably not gonna happen, uh, but at least it gives us a hint in terms of how we can get this thing installed. Uh, we notice a CMake lists file that's pretty tiny. So we'll probably have to use CMake for this. Um, and it has a C++ input file and an, uh, a header file as well. Hopefully CMake knows what to do with this. So this gives us some clues already on how we can get this thing installed. Manually, it's pretty easy, uh, but the question is how do we get this uh, done by easy build? So before we do that, let's make sure we have our environment properly set up. Um, and I probably still have the hierarchy set up here. Yes, so let me start a new. Terminal, so try and get in. This probably didn't work. Oh, yes, it did. Okay, so that's a clean environment that helps a bit. So I'm going to do the basic easy build configuration, install stuff to home easy build and use a temporary directory for build path because we don't want to have this on the shared file system. And I'll make sure that we pick up the central uh, software stack that the pre-installed stuff so we don't have to start from scratch. The starting point is the mandatory easy config parameters, name, version, homepage and description, and then which tool chain we're gonna use. So that's the bare minimal. So we create a file like this. And let me actually remove the tool chain part and show you what EasyBuild will do. It will just scream at us for not defining the tool chain part. Uh, ah, okay, it actually first looks at the easy block. Um, so that's problem one to fix. So it says fail to process easy config file, no software specific easy block found for EB tutorial. That makes sense. We're not gonna implement an easy block here. We're gonna ask it to please use the CMake make easy block since after looking at the readme, this has a strong match it seems. So we just tell easy build, please use this generic easy block and try again. And now I deliberately removed the tool chain definition and it says, okay, mandatory parameter not provided in, well, the pi header thing is I guess a bit confusing, but it basically means we're not defining the tool chain. So I'll add that here as well. You see me adding things in a particular order here. So I, I put easy block on top and tool chain at the bottom of what we have right now. That's just um, out of pure habit. There's actually no order here. Um, so these could be all jumbled up and they're just key value definitions. EasyBuild doesn't care too much. But usually what we do is we, we try to keep the same structure in easy config files just to make it easier for humans. When they open an easy config file, they always see the same thing, easy block on top, name, version, homepage, description, tool chain, and then um, it more or less follows the the order in which EasyBuild will use these um, easy config parameters. That just makes it a lot easier for us. So we now have these mandatory parameters. We, we've told it which easy block to use. So that makes it actually go ahead and do something useful. So the first problem we hit is lots of screaming. Um, it looks like it generated a CMake command, but it failed to run it. So let's open up our log file here and see what happened. Like there's no clear 
actual error message in here. It just says, I tried this and it gives me actually a partial command, not the full thing. So we jump into the log file and we start looking for error messages. And this certainly looks like a problem. CMake command not found. Yeah, that's not gonna work. If we don't have CMake available, we won't be able to get this thing installed. So first problem to solve is tell EasyBuild that we want to use CMake and which version of CMake we want to use. Now, luckily in the prepared environment, CMake is already installed. That's good, this particular version. So that's what we'll try to use. Um, and the tool chain at least looks very close to the one we are using. Now, there's, a, there's a difference between GCC core and GCC, which I, I won't go into here too much. It relates to the module hierarchy and where things are placed and what you can reuse across different tool chains. Um, but let's just uh, say that this CMake version is compatible with the, tool, with the GCC tool chain we're gonna use here. So we should be able to tell EasyBuild to use this uh, as a build dependency. The module is already there. That helps a lot. Uh, CMake is a build dependency. So we'll add it to build dependencies. That, that matters because build dependencies will be loaded in the environment uh, that EasyBuild sets up when doing the installation, but it will not include the module load command in the resulting module file. So when you load EB tutorial, it will not load CMake because you don't really need CMake to run um, this particular software package. You only need it to build it. So that's why we make this a build dependency. So that should be enough. That Specifying it as a build dependency means EasyBuild will load the CMake module when doing the build. So uh, if this module is correct, it should provide a CMake command that we can use for the installation. I'll um, enable trace mode so we have a better view on what's actually going on. So now we have to restart the build from scratch because yeah, CMake failed. So um, we won't get very far right now. Uh, it's again failing in the configure step. Uh, at least thanks to trace, it's now giving us the full CMake command, but that's still failing and failing quite quickly. So let's take a look again at the log file because there's no trace of an actual error in here. So now it's actually CMake itself screaming at us and saying, look, you're telling me to configure something, but I couldn't find a CMake list. .txt. That's strange because if we look at the impact sources here, there is a CMake list.txt there. So why is it complaining? So let's take a look at the build directory to see what's in there. So if we do show config again, where is our build directory located? We configured easy build to use temp username as build directory. Uh, and in here, we still have an HDF5 and an SIP from a previous attempt, I guess. EB tutorial version 101 must be in here somewhere, a subdirectory for the compiler that we're using, for the tool chain that we're using. And in here, there's an object directory. This is created by the CMake make easy block. So it, it doesn't do a build in the source directory, but separate. But all of this is empty, so there's nothing there. So it seems like CMake was right for once about complaining about something. So why is it not there? Well, because we didn't, didn't specify any sources. Uh, so remember, sources are not mandatory, which is a bit strange, um, but it does make sense in some cases. But in this case, of course, we need to tell EasyBuild where the source files are. Uh, if we go back to the top, um, this is basically what we need. This is the location of the source tarball. Uh, and I think I'm running ahead of myself a bit, but so basically we want EasyBuild to, to use this as sources. That's good. Now there's one thing annoying here. I'm hard coding the version, even though it's specified already there. Can I avoid that? Yes, I can use a template for this. 
similar to the Fiverr template we were uh, showing earlier. So this is basically a placeholder. Easybot will replace this with the value here. So we don't have this hard coded. And actually, this is a very common pattern, name dash version dot dot gz. And it's so common that we have a constant for this, which is exactly, well, it is basically this name dash version. So what you'll often see in easy config files is a line like this that just says it's a standard source start ball um, and easy build knows what to do with this. So that tells easy build to unpack sources or yeah, grab sources, unpack sources and do the CMake uh, command in there. That's good, but this will probably fail again because easy build doesn't have these sources yet. Come on VI. I hope this comes back. Um, we jump here. This probably tells us. Yeah, so the source directory, the same error as we uh, saw in the log file. Uh, empty directories, which means we didn't specify the sources. So that's what we did right now. If I try this, unless I didn't clean up properly, uh, it's going to scream at me again because it doesn't have the source file anywhere. And it takes a while to check because it, it actually has a fallback mechanism to some kind of source mirror, but it won't be able to find this there. So it does scream at us for not finding this. We can fix this by telling EasyBuild where to download it from. So source URL without the source file name, and EasyBuild will use this if it can't find the source file to download it and then happily continue. It will only download it if it can't find it on the file system already. Okay, so if we try this again, it's again failing in the configure step and again in the CMake command. So maybe you'll start understanding why I don't like CMake. No, it's actually our fault in this case. So if we check out the error message, um, CMake is actually helpful and telling us, look, this configure option that is required. And if we look at CMake lists, uh, this will probably be specified somewhere as required in here. So if this thing is not defined, um, CMake gives up and says, look, you have to tell me um, the message to use for uh, this particular software package. So that means we have to add a configure option to CMake. The config opts, easy config parameter can be used for that. We need to define EB tutorial message. And here you have to know a little bit about CMake. So you do minus D and the name of the variable you want to set equals a value. So let's do hello IC21. Be a bit careful with quotes, of course, and then close the, the string value. So this is the actual argument that will be passed to CMake and we wrap this in single quotes because it's a string value, uh, a Python string value. Hopefully now CMake is happy. Oh, let me do this with trace mode again. So we have a, a better view on what's going on. That looks better. Configure step completed, build step completed, installation step completed, exit code zero. And now the sanity check is failing. So we didn't specify anything um, in terms of how easy build should check the installation. It has a fallback mechanism, which is the best we could come up with. That's looking for a non-empty bin directory and a non-empty lib directory or lib64. So either is fine. In this case, it found a non-empty bin. It didn't find a non-empty lib. If we check, easy build. Oh, having trouble again. Hopefully it will come back. Um, so if we check in the installation, we'll indeed see only a bin directory, no lib directory. So the best thing we can do is come up with um, uh, our own sanity check. So customized to this installation. 
So one thing we definitely want to look for is an EB tutorial binary. So that's what we expect for this installation. And then there's no other directories we can really look for um, that would be useful for this particular case. And what also makes sense is trying to run the EB tutorial commands. Now this doesn't have any options, but just running it should produce the message uh, that we gave when doing the configuration. Let's see if I can revive this. Ah, okay. Um, to make sure it's configured properly. And it was failing in the sanity check. So we'll just copy these and assume it's happy. And I'll add the missing bit, which is not strictly required, but the model class is usually specified, specified as well. This is what's used when you saw the, the different categories of modules. When I looked in, into the installed module files, uh, this is what's used there to do the, the splitting in categories. Okay, so sanity check is a bit more specific now. That's probably good. So we're actually checking on the installation. And now we can either redo the installation from scratch or because we actually know the installation completed correctly, but Easybuild disagreed because of the sanity check. Um, all we need to do is module only. So just run sanity check. If that passes, generate the module and we're done. So unless we messed up something, uh, that should be good enough. Okay, I didn't use trace mode, but if you do use trace mode, you'll see this. So. Easybuilt will check for the bin tutorial file. That should be okay. It will try to run this command and that should pass correctly as well. So it seems like that worked because the sanity check didn't complain. Um, if we do our module use correctly, not this one, easy build modules. Also the location where Easybuilt is installing the modules, we should find EB tutorial. That means we can load EB tutorial and we can run the command ourselves. And that's working as expected. So this gives you the complete easy config file, uh, which is basically what we came up here as well. There's one small additional thing here. This has a checksum, which we don't have here. Uh, so it's missing in this part. We could add it manually by downloading the sources and running uh, the SHA-256 sum command to figure out the checksum and then add it here in the checksums list or uh, EasyBuild actually has a way of doing that as well. As long as you're sure that the tarball that you have um, is fine, EasyBuild can calculate the checksum for you and add it automatically to the easy config file. So this did a replace, did a search, well, it did an injection of the easy config, of the checksum and the easy config file, which should not match exactly what you have here. So that's from scratch, creating an easy config file and doing a couple of iterations to work through it and make sure that EasyBuild does the proper thing. There's examples or I should say exercises, additional exercises, which I won't do um, in the interest of time um, to use this one as a starting point and tweak it a bit in several ways. So both a different configuration and a different version. And then um, using this one as a dependency for the Python bindings for EB tutorial. So that's also definitely a very nice um, example to go through. So try to create an easy config file from scratch for yourself and if you're stuck the solution is available um, as well to wrap up this part um, so manually creating or tweaking an easy config file is certainly possible sometimes it's a bit annoying especially if it's a uh, very simple changes so just bumping the version for example but easy build has support for um, options like try software version where it basically does a search and replace um, of the existing version and replaces it with the new version. Oh. Similar for toolchain, 
whatever toolchain is used in here, Easybuild will replace it with what you give it on the command line. Um, and also for other easy config parameters, there's try amend, but there you're already getting in, into uh, territory where things may not work as expected. So at least the try options could be of use when making trivial changes. And then to copy easy config files, you could search them, grab the lo full location and just use the CP command um, or what's easier. So let me, yeah, this one, for example, um, if you have an existing easy config file and just want to copy it to my sci-fi bundle.eb, you can use the copy EC option and easy build will go and look for this easy config file, locate it and copy it to the location that you give it. And you can use this as a starting point for uh, tweaking it. So that's a handy little uh, option as well. And that's the hands-on I did. And there's more exercises um, that you can try yourself. OK, that brings us to the part where we look at how, how Yulich and Compute Canada have been using um, easy build. So we'll, we'll start with Alan. And yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll drive the slide so Alan will just explain things. So uh, I'm Alan from Unix Supercomputing Center. Um, yeah, next slide already. Uh, we're, we're a bit behind time, so I'll, be, I'll try and be brief. Um, so Unix uh, Supercomputing Center is pretty old and pretty big. Uh, so it was set up, it's been around since 1987, about 200 people in there. Um, we currently have three systems. Jules is, is currently, at least this week anyway, is the biggest system in Europe. Uh, at number seven, and um, and it uses a modular supercomputing approach. That means there are different partitions of the machine with different um, hardware capabilities. And um, the DC, Eureka, Eureka DC in particular, is the newest generation. So that was the system that that kind of introduced this modular supercomputing technology. And um, that has a CPU partition that's that's about three point five petaflops, a GPU partition about fifteen, and another five from from a KNL partition. Um, we have a third system then, Yusuf, which is uh, AMD, again AMD based, Eureka DC is AMD based as well, the CPU part at least, and it has some V100 GPUs as well, so Jules has, has the A100 GPUs, and we use that for interactive workflow and for community services and infrastructure as well. Okay, and um, so uh, what about easy with that JSP in particular? So we've been using it in our production stack for, I introduced it there in 2014. And we've been using it since then. And now it's started out on a single system on Eureka, and now it's been used on all of the systems in Eureka. Um, in general, the way we approach is, or at least how, how people interact with us, is in the end, it's geared obviously towards the average user, right? So the people we get when they get allocated a project on one of our systems. And what that means is because we have such a large software stack and, and, and such a lot of tools that are dependencies that are usually not required or explicitly needed by people, and we hide a lot of indirect software. So we use um, this hidden dependency feature of EasyBuild a lot. Um, we have lots of tool chains um, because we have different hardware uh, on these machines that require that optimal, you, you know, the, the ideal compiler for these systems might change. So we have lots of different compilers and lots of different MPIs as well um, that we make available to people. So from very early on, we chose to go with the module hierarchy. And we also rename some of the modules at EasyBuild. So for example, in EasyBuild, Intel MPI is called IMPI. We didn't like that name, so we use in Intel MPI instead. Um, so we make a couple of these kinds of changes and a few tweaks as regard, as regard to mod as well. So we implement this feature of, of compiler and MPI families. And we also have custom module naming schemes. So I mean, when I talk about um, injecting the, the families, uh, this family feature Velmod, um, we have custom tool chains. We have custom easy configs in our own blocks as well. So we've custom parts of uh, things are customized in, uh, in, in all aspects of easy build. Um, we, after, especially after this amount of time, we find that this is a maintenance and a contribution issue. Um, having, our own, having our own stacks, our own tool chains is, is problematic for us, um, in terms of especially in terms of contributing back. So we try to control that now. And we're working hard to minimize this. Uh, as regards upgrading and retiring our software, um, so our idea is that we have something called a stage concept. 
So we always want that projects who come online to us use the latest available software, the latest available compilers, the latest available MPI, because our machines, a lot of our machines are the latest, right? So we want people to be able to use all the features that are available on them. And um, so we have this stages concept right now that used to, used to be that we update twice a year, but now we have so many systems that this is actually quite cumbersome. So we've reduced that to a, we update um, and make a large update of the stage uh, once a year. And um, we always encourage our users to adopt the latest software and dependencies. And this is for many good reasons, including mainly uh, performance and bug fixes and things like that. Um, it doesn't mean that that when we retire software that it disappears altogether and um, it's available indirectly so before we were first stage we always made people aware of they can access the old uh, infrastructure the old software um, and this is important for a lot of users right they actually don't want to change their stack over the lifetime of the project for for various reasons and um, so this is available to them but what changes is the default view Um, the other thing that we do is we're starting to use a lot now is, is hooks, the hooks feature of EasyBuild, um, both for our users and for our maintainers. Um, because now we allow people to um, install software on top of our, our stack. And it's, uh, we find it to be a, a pretty powerful alternative to customizations of the easy blocks and the easy configs, um, especially because it's much more automated it's in one location and it's very flexible. Um, it, it'll, it'll make things easier to maintain for us. And this in particular comes to easy config. So all these little tweaks, minor tweaks that we make and um, so that things are installed with these, these different names or the LMAD families, this is something that can, can be carried out within a hook that wasn't available when we started things. Um, and the other thing we use hooks for is to actually uh, guide user installations, right? So it, it enables them, but it also guides them. It tells people how to do things properly. So basically, for example, one of the features that we have on our hooks is that we don't allow people to install compilers or MPI runtimes, probably because installing a compiler, particularly something like GCC, usually involves installing an entire stack of software underneath as well. And you usually don't need to do this, right? So if someone is, you get a little message in that they should talk to us first. And also the same with MPI. All of our MPIs are heavily tuned for the system. So, so we wouldn't expect that people should install their own MPIs. They should be using the one that we provide. Um, and the other thing that we do is because we allow um, user installations, we do that in a hierarchy. So people offer the system, system installations uh, at the group level so they can share installations with other people or they can install for themselves right at the user level or they can do it in a hierarchy of the two. So they can go from system build on top of that with group and then have their own installations on top of that group and a hierarchy as well. I think that might be it for me, yeah. Okay, thanks a lot, Alan. Up over to Bart. I'll wait for my camera to show up, I guess. Am I visible? Yeah. Okay, uh, yes, welcome everybody. My name is Bart Ullman. I'm, I'm talking about how we're using EasyBuild at Compute Canada. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. Yes, yeah, so Compute Canada is a, a bit of a consortium, which is then um, divided into several regional organizations. So in the West, West Grid, Compute Ontario, Coco Quebec, uh, ACENET. I myself am employed at uh, McGill University, and which is part of Coco Quebec. And uh, and so we're we're collaborating a lot and. Um, we have, uh, so we have this consortia of institutions. And so within Canada, there's about 200 technical staff who manage these supercomputers and help um, help the users uh, using them. Um, we have 15,000 user accounts. So this is uh, Canadian researchers and collaborators who have access to our supercomputers. Uh, this is all free. They, if anybody, who works at the Canadian research can get a, an account. And then there is a, a contest every year where they can get uh, more compute time than the, the default allocation. Next slide, please. So, so we're basically working as uh, like a collaboration of large uh, medium systems, mostly. Uh, we have one cloud system in the West Arbutus um, on the left-hand side, that's, that's in uh, Victoria, in British Columbia. Then in, in Vancouver, we have a, a, the, the Cedar system. Then we have Graham in uh, Waterloo in Ontario, and uh, Niagara in Toronto, and uh, Beluga uh, Ryan in Montreal. So next one. 
so what we have is is that the, the goal is that um, when we introduced the, the new national supercomputers, we wanted to have a consistent user interface so that basically people could log in to Graham and get their jobs running there. And then if they would switch to another supercomputer like Cedar or Beluga, they would get pretty much the same uh, interface. So they have the same modules, they have the, uh, um, the commands work the same. And so when one cluster is down for maintenance, they can just work on another cluster and things are pretty pretty much the same. So you don't have a new learning experience with different module names, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, so this consistency is important. And for that, we have a mechanism where we actually distribute our binaries uh, across Canada using the CERN virtual machine file system. And we also eliminate the OS factor. So we have an, an, an what we call compatibility layer that's in between the OS and the modules that we install via easy build. And on, of course, we also need a module interface, LMOT. Can use the next slide, please. So CVMFS um, is basically a distributed file system which works via multiple caching layers. So we have a stratum zero uh, which has uh, where where we push the the modules into the software, etc., which is then cached by stratum one, strata one, and then there are um, supercomputers which can also cache some data via squids. So once the software is loaded on the supercomputer and somebody else loads the same software again, it's it's cached locally and so they, they don't have any any network latency issues. Next slide please. So our our design is basically built on a layered approach. Uh, this is this has uh, caught some some interest, uh, particularly in Europe, because uh, the, they have now started the Easy project, where they've they've um, worked on an approach to do that uh, in a European wide. Uh, it's, uh, there's some technical difference between them, but this is this being used as a template for the Easy project. Um, and so there's a multi-layer approach where at the bottom we have things that we don't install via easy build or anything is always local of course with the linux kernel uh, some legally restricted software such as fasp uh, then we have gray areas um, of of stuff that that we could install in cvmfs sometimes we do sometimes we don't uh, but the important part here is that we have uh, a compatibility layer so what we have is gen2 prefix at the moment which provides basically one module for an enormous amount of tools, uh, the GNU libc, auto tools, bake bash, uh, core utils, et cetera, et cetera. That is all put in a single directory, uh, the Gen2 2020 directory, which is um, loaded via module. And by providing that users can, can use a consistent set of, of tools which is then not provided by the OS. So they're not coming from RPMs. If you type LS, you get an LS from our compatibility layer and you don't get it from uh, from the, um, from say the Red Hat uh, core U2 installation. So from that, we have a consistent bottom layer that is the same across every cluster, whether they use CentOS 7 or CentOS 8 or Ubuntu or anything. And then at the top level, we use, uh, we use, uh, easy build to install modules. Uh, there's a lot of similarities with with, with Yuli in the, in, in the way that we're working with it. I'll get to that in a minute as well. But we also have something a little bit like stages. Now with the Gen2 layer, we move to the 2020 directory and we have also in between some updates. So, so they have stages every year. We have more or less a major update every two years. So we're going even a little bit slower than that. Next slide, please. So the number of, of modules has uh, exploded over previous years. We keep installing things. We have different models also for multiple architectures. Uh, SSC3 is the bottom layer for some very old clusters. Then we have AVX, AVX2 for the, that's the major stack and AVX512 for, for Skylake newer clusters. Um, and overall, we, we have more than 6,000 modules installed in our stack. Um, 
and you'll see that by, by type, you know that the, uh, the most diverse uh, group is bioinformatics. They just have a lot of different software packages that they're using. And uh, there's a bit of everything else as well. Next slide, please. So we we are modifying easy build uh, much in the same way that 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 Yuliki has also been um, modifying some easy build things in the in the framework and easy blocks etc. We also try to minimize these differences, but there's some major differences with how how they are used upstream. So one thing is that the compatibility layer already provides new enough versions of many software packages. So we don't really have to provide easy configs for all kind of the boring dependencies. So in Yulik, they are hidden, but we just don't provide them. We, we just let them be used by, by the Gen2 layer. So these are tools like M4, um, most CMake installations. Uh, and uh, and there's, there's a lot of libraries that have models attached to them and the users don't really load them directly they just load them as dependencies because uh well they're, they're kind of boring they are they're not chromax or 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 namd or some other packages that they're interested in but things like like lib and curses and and other boring dependencies um we we very much used mkl as a, as a central math library and and that means that we're we're not using the fosten or intel uh tool chains uh, so having like MKL and OpenMPI centrally uh, means that we're we're gravitating to other tool chains, the GeoMKL and IOMKL. That's just an accommodation of OpenMPI and, and Intel MKL, and then and then we have variations of compilers and CUDA versions. So with that, we can often use recipes directly from Easy Build upstream, but then use options like try tool chain and try software version and stuff like that to. To, uh, to to install a piece of software without having to modify the easy config file. Uh, we also have a custom module naming scheme actually based on the one from Yulich, but we we do things like having lowercase module names. Uh, we have no version suffix and we hide the tool chains. And we also use something called rpath. Uh, so we, we eliminate the use of LD library path so that, that we don't have surprises in the libraries. And we do that using a a wrapper for the uh, for the linker. So we have a, a script that wraps around the LD utility, and we make sure that our path is injected properly, even when users compile their own software. Next slide. We also use hooks, much like in Yulich. So we we so this way we can use the original easy configs for instance, to put in custom configuration options for OpenMPI. So the config ops in an easy config can be changed dynamically using a hook. Uh, we can put footer code to have like, uh, to, to, to put special Lua code in the modules uh, to support installation users' home directories. Um, we even have like uh, um, injecting via hooks. We put post install commands to, to split Intel uh, compiler installation because part of it can be redistributed and part can not be redistributed, so we split it, um, and we 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 do it also by stripping down extension lists. So hooks can be really powerful if you just want to have a central place to modify things on the fly. Next slide, please. Uh, we also handle Python a little bit differently, uh, so we we. We usually install things on the side of, of the major packet. So we install PyQt5 of Qt5, OpenCV Python of OpenCV when we can. Um, and we try to make the module compatible with all versions of Python that we install. So we don't we not just have one Python 2 and one Python 3 version, but we have Python 2.7, 3.6, 3.7, and 3.8 all installed in parallel. Um, and one, the, the biggest difference is that we don't really install many Python packages modules, just the basics, but we mostly tell users to uh, create per, per virtual environments in their home directory, and then they can install stuff using pip from Python wheels so that they can be very flexible in which Python packages they want to use. And, and uh, there are always people who want to do their own thing. And because they use Anaconda on their own computer, they want to use it on the supercomputer. And that, that often runs into issues because Anaconda 
uh, tries to install everything and just loads binaries for OpenMPI, for instance. So we really discourage the use of Anaconda. Next slide, please. Um, one thing you can do too is actually that you can mount our software stack on your uh, on your own computer. This is particularly easy if you're using a Linux laptop or desktop. It's a little bit harder if you have a Mac or, or Windows computer, but even uh, if you use WSL2, you could even mount it on Windows. Uh, with a Mac, you have to use a virtual machine. Um, and so have a look at it. If you're interested, then you can just uh, mount it and you can uh, load all the software that we use and, and pretty much pretend uh, that on your local computer, you're running the same software as on a supercomputer. So for our research, that research is quite helpful because they can do a test run on their own computer without even having to log into the supercomputer, having to deal with login node limits and having or having to start interactive jobs or stuff like that. They have the exact same so software stack on their own uh, computer. So this was a short worldwide tour of uh, the way that we're using Easy Build in Compute Canada. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bart. <clears throat> okay, we're over time a little bit, but I think we'll still manage to wrap up in time. So let me continue. If there's any questions, we can try to take those at the end or feel free to post them in the tutorial channel in Slack. Um, so a little bit about the Easy Build community. Um, as I already mentioned, it has grown out to be a worldwide community. We're very happy with that. We never expected that. That was not our intention. Uh, originally, it sort of happened by itself. Um, the picture you see is from the last physical Easy Build user meeting we had in Barcelona, early 2020. Um, this, one, this year we also had a user meeting, but it was fully virtual for reasons you well know. Um, so our Slack is very active, it has close to 500 members, uh, about 100 active people there throughout the week. So there's usually always, always somebody there who can answer your question or at least put you on the right path by point, pointing to documentation or giving some hints. Um, it's used very actively in Europe, but also in the US, in Asia, Australia. So we're very happy with that. And we have regular uh, conf calls every other week. We have a, a one hour conf call where we look at recent developments, things we should be doing or are doing. Um, and the user meetings uh, have been taking place yearly for the last four or five years, and hopefully we can keep them going. Um, if you're interested in contributing to EasyBuild, that's uh, definitely welcome as well. There's different ways. Uh, you can just provide feedback or report bugs or join discussions, or you can get your hands dirty um, and try to contribute back easy config files or maybe even improvements to easy blocks or the EasyBuild framework itself, if you know a bit of Python coding. Uh, that should certainly be possible as well. In extending, enhancing documentation is, of course, very useful too, even though I think we're, quite, we're doing quite well there. Now, one, one thing I do want to highlight um, is the, the integration we have with GitHub, um, which makes it very easy uh, and very smooth to contribute back to EasyBuild. You don't even have to know Git um, at all yourself or have experience with GitHub because we automate most of that uh, for you straight from the easy build command line. So you can open pull requests, update pull requests. Easy build maintainers can review pull requests straight uh, from the, easy, the EB command line without ever uh, visiting GitHub. And that, that not only facilitates the life of the maintainers, but also of contributors. They can uh, make contributions easily and things are let's say pre-process in a way that we will want them anyway, and it does that for you automatically. So in the last couple of years, we've been getting over 2000 pull requests for easy config files per year. So not including framework or easy blocks. So that's quite a lot. And we basically had to um, add some automation in there to make this feasible. This is all well documented. There's a part in the, in the previous tutorial as well that explains it in detail, or I think it's even included in here. So if we skip the ULIG part and the Compute Canada part, this was covered in detail in the slides. Easy build community, briefly discussed it as well. Yeah, I think this gives a demo of how to contribute back something to Easy Build straight from the Easy Build command line. There is a bit of setup that you have to do for this. 
Um, well, first of all, it explains you how to do it manually, but I would not recommend doing it manually because you have a way better way of doing that. Um, there's a little bit of configuration you have to do. You have to install a couple of extra Python packages um, in the Python version that you're using to run EasyBuild. Um, so there's a, a bit of hoops to jump through before you can start using this. But once you've done that, it becomes very, very easy. And if all goes well, I actually have that set up in here. Um, so let me see. If you have things set up correctly, you can ask EasyBuild to do a, a check for the GitHub features. And then EasyBuild will go ahead and make sure that everything is in place, which is not the case here. Why not? Um, okay, let me make sure I don't have any modules loaded. I did. Ah, okay, wrong one. Um, Build GitHub user. So I'm, I'm using a, a separate test GitHub account for this. But all the requirements and the GitHub token, so like a password to talk to GitHub automatically, should be in place already. That looks okay. It has Git Python, which it needs to do Git commands um, automatically. So that looks all right. It's now testing whether this all works. So it's actually talking to GitHub and trying to do some actions and it should come back that this is all working okay. Um, and once that works, we can actually open the pull request. Let me open GitHub EV tutorial. So what I want to do is send a pull request to this uh, easy configs repository, which is a fork of the central one. Um, but I configured EasyBuild here to look to target this separate repository instead. And what I can now do is open a pull request, for example, for the EB tutorial easy compre file we created earlier. All I need to do is use, once the configuration is done, is use EB new PR, give it the easy compre file, and it will go ahead and open the pull request for me. Now, what it will do is it will parse the easy compre file, look what's in there, um, try to figure out the right location, it should go into the repository. It will create a Git branch for me. It will push that branch to GitHub. It will do the equivalent of clicking around in the GitHub interface to open the pull request. So all of that is done fully automatically and I don't have to worry about getting things right, making sure that the pull request title is okay, the branch is okay, the file location is okay. That should uh, all be done automatically. So if I just refresh the page here, um, I can see it has opened this pull request for me with a nice title. If I look at the changed files, this is the contents of the easy config file I was coming up with. And note that it renamed and relocated the easy config file for me because the repository has a certain structure. So it knows about that. It targeted the develop branch, which is what we like to do for contributions. And we can even take this a, a step further. And now that's let's say now I have my maintainer hat on, I see this contribution coming in. I wanna test this contribution. I'll have to do a rebuild to reinstall it, but I can tell EasyBuild, please pull the easy config file from pull request number five, try to install it. So I will do this of course in the test environment, not in the production environment. Um, but this pulls in the easy config file from GitHub from this pull request. Um, it will try to do the installation that seems to work. And then to show that that works, I can actually upload the test report back into GitHub. So I'll do the rebuild again, but now tell EasyBuild to do an upload of a test report and you'll see a comment popping up here um, to confirm that the installation worked on this particular system. So if that goes well, I won't even need to refresh. Yeah, there it goes. So this is a test report by uh, EV Tutorial. So the, this GitHub account on this uh, Learn HPC node using uh, a Broadwell and a Python 3.8. And if I click the gist file, this will give me more details, how long it took, what the easy build configuration was, the system details, how many cores, all of that, all of that information is available here. Now this was a successful test report. If it's a failing one, I, I'll actually get a partial log file as well. So the maintainer can help the contributor to figure out what went wrong and try to fix the problems together. 
So this is a very, very powerful feature. And this is also why we get two, 2,000 pull requests a year um, in terms of contributions. So again, this is well documented how to set this up, how to start playing with this. You can use this to do contributions into the central repositories, or if you have your own Git repository for managing easy config files, you can also use it to um, add stuff in there. So all of this mess of Git commands and moving files around in the right place and making sure the names are okay is all fully automated. Okay, so let's wrap up. Um, a couple of things we didn't cover, and I actually, there's things I didn't mention here as well. Um, we do have documentation of each of those things. So implementing easy blocks from scratch um, is covered well in the documentation. We have a tutorial section on that as well. Same thing for hooks, good documentation covered in the tutorial as well. Somebody in the Slack channel was asking about that. Uh, we can tell EasyBuild to use RPOT linking. You can use EasyBuild as a Python library. You can ask EasyBuild to submit installations as jobs to a cluster. So if you have Slurm um, and you need to install 10 things or EasyBuild notices there are nine missing, missing dependencies, it will submit 10 jobs to the cluster and make sure these things are installed in order. So you don't have to, you're not stuck to a single node uh, if you have an empty cluster that you have access to. Uh, also on Cray systems, EasyBuild works quite well. CSCS has been using, uh, CCS in Switzerland has been using EasyBuild for years on their flagship system, Pitstained, uh, to manage their software stack, uh, which is a Cray system. So that's a bit dif different from a regular um, Linux cluster. And there's also some support for building um, container images with EasyBuild, but that's experimental. And I must say, it's not really actively developed currently. That may change in the future. Now, one burning question you may have, especially if you've also attended the SPAC tutorial yesterday, um, is how these tools are different. So from a bird's eye view, they're, they look very similar. They're both implemented in Python. They have their main focus is on facilitating software installations for HPC. Um, but how they work is quite different. And also some details like the licensing is, is, is different maybe, and I know <laughs> The spec developers disagree with me on this a bit, um, but in my view, the, the focus of both tools is on a different use case and, a, and, and let's say different uh, types of people. While EasyBuild is more focused on HPC support teams um, and maybe maybe HPC sysadmins who, who manage a central software stack for their users. Um, I would say spec is more focused on software developers um, who want to juggle lots of different uh, dependency versions and compilers and MPI libraries and so on. Um, that doesn't mean you can not use spec to do central software installations, you can. Same thing, developers can probably also use EasyBuild and, and make their work a bit easier there or end users can use both EasyBuild and spec to manage their own software stack, that all works. But the focus of the tools is a bit different. Um, the, the good things are they have support for lots of software they're very actively developed and maintained by a supportive community. So if you're interested in SPAC, definitely take a look at their Slack or their tutorials. Uh, they do a very good job there as well. Um, and the developers of these tools are also talking to each other. So we're, we're not enemies and there's SPAC maintainers even in this tutorial today as well. So we're, we're, we're both very open to talking to each other and even helping each other out. And then one more thing to wrap up. Um, there's a, a new project, the, the, what we call the EASY project, the European Environment for Scientific Software Installations. We call this EASY and that's not by accident. So EASY build is a big part of this, um, which is basically trying to um, not only replicate what Compute Canada has done of building a software stack that can be used anywhere, not only on HPC systems, but also on, on workstations of, of researchers and in the cloud, Azure, AWS, all of that. Um, we're, we're trying to build this on a European level as well and make it a bit more open first to uh, contributions from the outside, which I think is a bit difficult in the way that Compute Canada has done things. Um, and we all, we're also pulling it open to, to uh, let's say, broader architecture. So we're not only looking at x86, but also looking at ARM and power. And if RISC-V ever comes of age enough that it's relevant for HPC, we will look at that as well. Um, so this is a, a really 
fairly big project. It's fairly new. It's about a year old um, right now where we're, we're looking to build a common software stack that works anywhere. Um, and yeah, this is a high level overview and you'll recognize the very similar layers to what Compute Canada has. Um, so we use CVMFS for the distribution of the software and we have a compatibility layer in the middle um, to make sure we're compatible with different types of Linux uh, operating systems where we use Gen2, again, very much like Compute Canada does. Uh, and then a software layer where we use EasyBuild to install software. So yeah, from a high level overview, it looks very different. Uh, but if, if this sounds interesting to you, definitely take a look at our documentation and our website. We have some recent videos, recorded talks on there that explain things in detail uh, into why this is interesting. And, and again, this is sort of a spin-off from the EasyBuild community. A lot of people active in EasyBuild are also active there. Um, so yeah, maybe this is even the, the way of the future. We'll see how that works out in the next couple of months and years. So that wraps it up um, more or less on time. So that's very good. Um, there's a couple of links here, website documentation, this tutorial and previous versions of the tutorial that have a couple of additional topics like hooks um, that are covered there. I have a yearly easy build user meeting where everybody's welcome to join. Both experienced easy build users and people new to it are definitely welcome. And uh, if you need help, mailing list, mailing list Slack and the conference calls are definitely the best place to, uh, to go to. So with that, uh, we can wrap up here or take any questions if there are any questions in the Zoom session. Um, and if not, yeah, feel free to pass by any time in the EasyBuild Slack. And if you have any questions later, somebody will definitely help out and try to get them answered. There's no more questions. Thanks a lot for joining. Uh, one thing very important, um, ISC has asked us to try and make sure you fill out the survey. So if you go to the ISC website and the schedule and uh, in the schedule. Yeah. If you find the EasyBuild tutorial page, you'll see a rate this tutorial button. So please click this and uh, tell us how you liked it or didn't like it perhaps, or what we could do better um, the next time. So please make sure you do the, the evaluation. That's very important for ISC um, and for us as well. And with that, yeah, I just wanna thank everybody who joined us today. Um, and I hope it was useful.